Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our third and final panel of this year's uh, conference within the projects of European Times. It is so great to see you all in our day three of this conference. We have already had two wonderful, really insightful panels. On our first day, we spoke a lot about the history of uh, natural history and uh, also the history of ideas. Um, in uh, um, our second day, we discussed in really great detail the incredible trajectories of uh, the development of formalism in the Ukrainian 1920s between formalism proper and sociologism as well. And today we have our third panel, which is going to focus on the questions of the complexities of scientific exchange, which is so important, of course, for the topic of this year's conference, the history of science during the Cold War era. We're going to have three presentations that are going to tackle quite different questions on the one hand, but at the same time, we are going to see some points of contact between them as well. And I'm really looking forward to our joint discussion. So before we get started, just a couple of words of housekeeping. Um, in the first place, as you all very well know, we're being live streamed, which is important to say. And this panel, in this panel, we will have the incredible three and a half hours for us to delve really deeply into our discussions. And we are going to have three wonderful speakers today. Uh, that's uh, Adela Hinku from the new European College in Bucharest. We have Roland Tvetkovsky from the University of Cologne. And we have Sergei Zhuk from Ball University in the United States. We are especially happy to have uh, Sergei with us, given that it's so early in the United States, and it's a good reminder for us um, the reminder about the non-simultaneity, the simultaneity of non-simultaneous. So that is a very great epitome for us of, of that idea. And so um, unlike the two previous panels, I would like to suggest to have a slightly different format today in terms of the way we're going to proceed. Um, and in particular, I would like us to give each speaker a chance to give their presentation and then to have um, a Q&A, an initial Q&A after that, because first of all, the, the topics, like I mentioned, are quite different in a sense. And second of all, this will give a chance, of course, for our speakers as well to have enough focus on their particular research. So I propose to take, let's say, three questions or so to begin with after each talk. And then uh, please do you write your questions in the chat box. And if there are any questions that are left unanswered to begin with, we, of course, are going to post them after all of the presentations have been made. So please do avail yourself of the chat box function throughout our panel today. And you can either post your question there or you can just put a question mark. And I would be really happy to give the floor to you uh, later on so that you could ask that question in person. OK, well, uh, with all that housekeeping out of the way, I suppose we can get the ball rolling. And it is my pleasure indeed to present our first speaker today, Adela Hinku. So a couple of words about Adela. Adela studied world and comparative literature at the University of Bucharest and modern history at Central Euro European University. She received her PhD in comparative history from Central Euro European University in 2019 with a dissertation on the history of social thought and sociology in state socialist Romania entitled Accounting for the Social in State Socialist Romania Context and Genealogies, 1960s to 1980s. Adela researches the history of social sciences, intellectual history and feminist thought during state socialism, as well as social thought and social policy after 1989. Adela has held numerous fellowships at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, uh, New Europe College in Bucharest, Center for Advanced Studies in Sofia, Imre Katish College 
in Yemen. So as you can see, quite a few. And uh, uh, Adala has a number of publications and perhaps uh, it is especially relevant to mention the volume that Adela co-edited in 2018, entitled Social Sciences in the Other Europe since 1945, uh, uh, which is going to be especially relevant for our discussion today. So Adela, without further ado, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for the invitation, as well as for the wonderful presentations yesterday from which I have learned tremendously. Um, I'm really glad to be able to be here and present something from my research. Um, I should say that this is uh, partly the result of well, my dissertation research and the co-edited volume, but also it is something of an exploratory research. Uh, so this um, idea of a socialist sociology is, um, is something that I have been meaning to uh, research for quite some while. What I will present to you today are my preliminary ideas about uh, what that was and why we should care about it. So I'm very glad to receive your feedback uh, on it as I move forward with the project. Uh, I will now um, share my screen uh, and um, hopefully you can um, you can confirm that you see. Uh, oh, OK, sorry. Uh, just a second. OK, I am trying to. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do this in a way that, okay. Don't worry, this is just a great chance for us to think about not to not again. Yeah, of course. Um, just a second, because I want to only share um, part of my screen, which I think will not be possible, unfortunately. So then I will try again. Apologies for this. This is this has been the light motif of the Zoom era, unfortunately. So. We can all relate to Mandela, <laughs> so <laughs> please be our friend about that. Don't worry. Don't okay. worry at all. Uh, right. So you, you will see a bit of a skewed uh, version of this, unfortunately, but it will have to do. So again, the second try. Right, here it is. So yeah, unfortunately you will also see this um, side panel, but uh, I hope that's I hope that's not too much of a problem. Okay. Um, so here we go. I um, I chose this um, this photo in order to illustrate my presentation because I think it is a quintessential image of uh, non simultaneity uh, for nineteen for the nineteen seventies for a state socialist country. This is um, a photo from the third a third world future research conference, which was organized in Bucharest um, in the mid 1970s, and which brought together uh, researchers uh, in futurology from uh, West and from, um, from the West and from state socialist countries, as well as from the global South. And this was a moment when, uh, when um, um, there was a keen interest in trying in some way to also, uh, not just to, um, to tackle the problem of non-simultaneity between the so-called first, second and third worlds, but also to, uh, to tackle it for the future, right? So we tend to think uh, of simultaneity or non-simultaneity in terms of the present or the past, uh, but this is a case in which the goal, the explicit goal was to create something of what was then called a common future for uh, humanity. So for the three worlds. Uh, and the other uh, reason why this is, a, a, I think, a beautiful illustration of non-simultaneity is this um, uh, mural that you see behind the presenters. So uh, this conference was held at the um, uh, National Academy for uh, Economic Studies. And this, um, this huge mural um, is, uh, represents uh, the history of the Romanian people. So I think this uh, juxtaposition of um, of this um, interest, uh, obsessive interest uh, about the past and especially about the national past in 1970s Romania um, with this um, interest in the future. I think this is a, a nice illustration of uh, our, um, maybe the topic for our panel today more generally. 
This being said, uh, I will just give you a short outline of um, what I would like to present today. So, um, maybe I can do this. Yes, I can. Uh, so, um, what I would like to present today is um, uh, first um, an overview of uh, social sciences in the other Europe. Um, why uh, why is this a topic that um, that uh, should um, fit our interest in non simultaneity? Um, then I would like to briefly discuss why out of the social sciences sociology is one of the um, most interesting disciplines uh, for this topic. Uh, in a third part of my presentation, I will discuss the project of socialist sociology. Um, so as I said, this is more of an exploratory uh, part of my research. And then um, the last part of the presentation will be a case study uh, of uh, how, um, how looking at this project of socialist sociology through a lens uh, of a national um, um, discipline, in this case, sociology in Romania, uh, can give us a sense of why the project mattered. So I will, I will present the case study of social structure research uh, in Romania. Now, um, to move, um, just maybe just a word on this uh, image that I put here, because uh, uh, I think this is also illustrative of the broader um, context of my presentation. This is, um, um, an image from um, the registration hall of the Ninth World Congress of Sociology, uh, which happened in 1978 in Uppsala, Sweden. And I put it here in order uh, to give a sense of the scale that sociology had um, by that time. So uh, the number of people that, uh, that it was bringing together. Um, by the uh, end of the 1970s, sociology truly mattered. Uh, I will now move uh, immediately to the topic of social sciences in the other Europe. Uh, okay, and I see that immediately that there is a problem here. Um, okay, let's see still if uh, if this might work. Uh, okay, In just a second. I'm sorry. This is uh, this is something that I have not attempted uh, until now which is this presenter view, but uh, unfortunately. Um, Please don't worry. It's, it's always good to have a yeah. bit of an experiment. Yeah, I wonder if uh, maybe um, the host uh, can check if I have all the um, sharing options implemented, because I should be able to choose to share only a part of the screen. And um, mm -hmm. I can't. And I wonder if this is something that can be fixed by the main host of mm -hmm. no of the actually session. you have all the all the all yeah the okay fine so then maybe it's a matter of uh, maybe it's a matter of just I don't know the version of the zoom okay it doesn't matter so what will happen then that is that you will also see my text um and uh uh, that's fine, I guess. So um, I will start with this project of social sciences in the other Europe. Um, and uh, and he here I, I put a photo of, um, of the volume that I co-edited, which I will discuss um, in very shortly. And I also put this um, photo from, uh, this is the library of the former um, academy, uh, party academy in Bucharest. So this was a special uh, academic institution for um, party members, but also that was supposed to train party local party elites. Uh, and after 1989, it was um, completely abandoned. And I like this photo and I put it here because it is a reminder of the fact um, that the history of Marxist-Leninist social thought um, and social sciences after 1989, more broadly in the region, was um, you know, very, very, very uh, rapidly, very uh, immediately forgotten despite the fact that there are very clear continuities that uh, that broach this uh, 1980s, 1990s period. And here is a photo that I think maybe I was among the last people who could still access this library. Uh, what happened was very literally that um, it, uh, not that it was destroyed, but nothing was done in order to preserve it. And I think this is a good metaphor for um, 
for the fate of uh, Marxist social sciences in the region more broadly. You see here that the fall is the um, ceiling is collapsing and so on. So um, the idea behind um, the project uh, of the edited volume and my interest in social sciences is that um, whereas we know a lot about cultural production, political thought, um, in uh, the history of state socialist of the state socialist period, and we know this partly because of the interest in dissident and oppositional culture, social sciences uh, for a long time have received comparatively less attention. Um, and although um, a field for Cold War social science uh, developed um, in the recent years, um, um, and well, actually in the past decades, at the intersection of uh, science and technology studies, intellectual history, and um, so on. The geography of this um, developing field has been overwhelmingly North American and Western European. Um, and we, we have, of course, um, valuable um, studies um, by the actors uh, themselves in the social sciences in Eastern Europe, self-thematizing uh, their own discipline. These have been published uh, abroad immediately after 1989. However, the role of the social sciences in, uh, in the region has remained generally unexplored, and this until recent years when um, there have been several edited works that brought together uh, different accounts of disciplines, of institutions, as well as individual and social, um, individual social scientists in Eastern Europe, as well as we have new um, histories of uh, the national development of um, social science disciplines, especially sociology. Um, so what the field of Cold War social science was describing were broad features such as the covert uh, patronage by military and gov government agency, post-war quantitative turn, uh, the um, self-fashioned scientific objectivity and the interest in grand theory. And um, all, these, um, uh, all these broad features opened the field to multiple accounts of disciplines, intellectual pursuits and research projects. Uh, and this is also true of the growing literature of um, social sciences in state socialism. So this volume that I co-edited uh, with Viktor Karadi in 2018 is one of these attempts. As I said, there are several very important works. And what we were trying to do is to bring together studies um, of, of, uh, from the post-war period, but also um, um, from the post-socialist period. Um, that reflect on the conditions of knowledge and uh, research on what is perceived and thematized as the European semi-peripheries by the social scientists themselves, right? So in this volume, we were asking how political, economic, social, and epist epistemological change is intertwined at the local and national levels. Uh, we asked about transnational interactions um, and also about broader global processes. And with this, we wanted to complicate how we understand post-war epistemological change in the social sciences and humanities. And the idea was not just to remind us that there was a parallel story that was going on uh, in the other Europe, but also to reflect on how this story was integrated and why it was not into a broader narrative of global transformation. So, um, okay, I, I, I also wanted to show you um, why I brought this cover here is because uh, I really like the, um, uh, this image of the, um, this is a library catalog, um, again, from this same library, party library in Romania. And again, this is a re representation of the epistemic uh, assumptions that underpinned um, social science, um, under state socialism, literally the way that knowledge was organized and categorized at the time. So, um, one of these points uh, I have already discussed is uh, whereas uh, it is to move from uh, an image of parallel developments to an image of interconnectedness, but what kind of interconnectedness? So not simply entangled history, but uh, also these feedback loops, the way in which the West perception of the East and the East perception of the West perception of the East uh, over time um, uh, were interconnected. Another uh, another um, um, point of interest um, is um, the contestation of Cold War social science. Uh, this has been um, a leitmotif of historiography 
was there really such a thing as Cold War sci social science? And on this point, I think that the history of social sciences in state socialism, uh, which were endlessly uh, mired by debates about the existence of socialist social sciences or not. Um, so this kind of history can be recovered um, because of its cultivated sensitivity to epistemological difference. Then on the point of grand theory, um, this was an ambition that was shared, failed, and redeemed on both sides of the Iron Curtain and um, placed in its proper context the accounts of resilience, resist uh, resistance, compromise, and efforts at scholarly self-legitimation in social science and social scientists' engagement with the state and with political establishment might become less central and also less overpowering in the scholarship on knowledge production in non-democratic regimes, right? So my point here is that um, um, looking at the development of social sciences and their state socialism can help us re uh, reshuffle, understand anew the relationship bet between state ideology and science in um, both democratic and non-democratic regimes. So instead of uh, this um, um, interest in uh, the autonomy of social scientists, which has mired uh, historiography of the discipline until now, we might look instead at hierarchies of epistemic power, uh, and the way in which they were internalized, reproduced, and subverted outside of the core, so outside of the Western core. And this would complement debates on the relationship between social scientists and power. And finally, um, here, directly to the issue of non-simultaneity, um, there was this often articulated perception of Eastern European social scientists of lagging behind. Um, and I think that this should also be seen in a long term, um, um, from a long term perspective as well, um, by, way, by way of looking uh, at how the hierarchies of epistemic power that were, uh, in which the social scientists were embedded, for instance, in international institutions, uh, such as the International Sociological Association. So how this experience of hierarchies of epistemic power translated over time in um, a self-understanding in terms of backwardness or lagging behind. So uh, what has happened is that um, researchers working on national case studies until now have generally attempted to place them in regional comparative or transnational contexts. Uh, and, um, and there has been interest in the circulation or co-production co of knowledge across the East to West divide. But this has largely overshadowed the collaboration among state socialist researchers or between them and social scientists from the global south. So what I will do in this presentation is that I make a case for why we should take seriously the former. So we should take seriously uh, the collaboration between social scientists from state socialist countries. And we should also ask preliminary questions about how to approach the latter. So how to approach their relationship with social scientists from the global south. I say preliminary because I have conducted research uh, in the archive of the International Sociological Association, uh, which is uh, hosted in uh, Amsterdam. And I have, I have been trying to, uh, to get at some of these connections between um, state socialists and um, global south uh, social scientists, and this has not been easy. So this is not um, this is not um, um, a, a, a something that is easy to reconstruct based on the institutional archives that we have. So we might need to think uh, of alternative ways of uh, finding sources and interpreting them. Uh, with this, I will move to the to the question of why um, why out of the social sciences we should care about sociology, or rather, why I care about sociology, um, and. Um, uh, I, I think that there are several reasons for this, and one of the important reasons for which sociology has so far been uh, interested, interesting for historians is that it has mobilized in different contexts, beginning in the late 1950s, uh, reformist intellectual clusters across the political spectrum, uh, so from factions of disenfranchised Stalinists to marginalized interwar specialists that had been previously involved in sciences of the nation to aspiring new technologies. Democrats. 
And uh, more generally, these patterns of sociologists' institutionalization do not neatly follow political front fault lines. Uh, and this has been shown by Mikhail Voryshek, um, and I have brought here um, a, a sort of summary of his argument because I think it is important to ground our discussion about non-simultaneity, which will be a discussion of intellectual epistemic assumption in one of um, institutionalization, right? So Voryshek has argued that the history of sociology under state socialism has been described so far in one of two ways. One way to look at it um, was as an alternative to Western bourgeois sociology with different epistemological assumptions stemming from Marxist Leninist theory, employing different methods, aiming to achieve different goals. The other way to think of socialist sociology was as a deviation from Western sociology, which was then corrected after the fall of state socialism in Eastern Europe after 1989. He, uh, Voryshek, argued that, uh, however, if you look at the history of sociology in Europe more broadly from an institutional perspective and not just from the perspective of Cold War antagonisms, it becomes possible to think beyond the East-West divide. So in a, fir fir in a first step, Voryshek um, um, looked at the countries of Eastern Europe and he identified two types of institutionalization, the Soviet type, um, and here you have the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, the GDR, Romania, and Hungary, and the revisionist type, uh, which I will show you a bit later. Um, but the revisionist type is basically everyone else, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. And the way he differentiated it is by looking at institutionalization in terms of uh, when did the bodies promoting research, um, when were they established, uh, when were teaching institutions established, how about professional organization? And how about the sociological discourse and the very use of the label of sociology, right? So based on these five um, um, elements that he identified, he distinguished between the Soviet and the revisionist type. Um, and um, OK. Um, uh, just a second. Um, so uh, you can see here from this um, from this nice uh, summary table that the institutionalization of sociology began in the mid 1950s um, and lasted until more or less the end of the 1960s. So it happened in different stages. Um, in the revisionist type, uh, institutionalization happened very fast. So within two or three years, whereas in the remaining countries, the process was much slower and took anything from 12 years, uh, as in the case of Hungary, to 30 years, as in the case of the GDR. And in the second step, and this is very interesting for our discussion of non-simultaneity, Voroshek analyzed the institutionalization of sociology across Europe. So he centralized data on 24 countries. And in this, uh, from this pers perspective, um, the, the Soviet type no longer appears as singular. Um, so in the Soviet type institutionalization was not much different from what Voroshek calls the distorted type. Uh, where there were impeding factors to institutionalization, such as conservative dictatorships in um, Spain or Greece, or ideological conservatism uh, in Ireland. And you can also see if we move closer to the center of the table that the marginal type here, um, Austria, Belgium, and Switzerland, um, where sociology didn't have a pre-World War II tradition, um, uh, institutionalization, uh, so it, there, there wasn't a pre-World War II tradition and there wasn't state support for institutionalization. And so the struggle to establish the discipline resembled um, more the revisionist, um, no, took even more than the revisionist type in state socialism, uh, and actually was more similar to the um, Scandinavian type, which was represented by Denmark, Finland, and Norway, where sociology was an instrument of social development after World War II and was institutionalized by the welfare state um, about as quickly as it was by the reformist state socialist um, countries. Uh, finally, we have the established type. This is the UK, France, Netherlands, and West Germany. And this is the one that really stands out as the outlier, as it relied on a long pre-Second World War tradition of institutionalization and experienced no discontinuity. Right. So like you can see from this um, short, my short summary of Voroshek's findings, uh, that what, uh, what 
what has stayed uh, in, in the East European kind of collective memory and has been repeated in terms of um, um, lagging behind of backwardness um, might actually be more of a constructed um, vision of, of the development of disciplines, right? Um, so sociology is ultimately remembered uh, from, because of this reason, is remembered as um, the quintessential product of this colonization in the social sciences. But, um, but this might have less to do with this colonization itself, which is a process fraught with tensions across disciplines. And it, have, it might have more to do with the ability of sociologists after 1989 to successfully disentangle the discipline from the web of party, ideological, and memory struggles surrounding the colonization. So if the first post-war decade was one of rearrangements meant, rearrangements meant to establish Marxism-Leninism as the official core epistemology in the social sciences and humanities, regardless to the extent um, to which this was achieved, the long 1960s were the high point for sociology throughout East Central Europe. Um, and this spectacular development of the discipline after what became known as the banning of sociology as a bourgeois pseudoscience was then followed by growing interest in sociology both at the time and in the post-socialist period. In the broad um, landscape of social, science, social sciences and humanities, sociology seemed not only very exciting and new, but also fashionable and uniquely attuned to the spirit of the age. Um, there has been interest um, in there was there has been some interest in reconstructing um, the cross national circulation of intellectual sources um, beyond the inner workings of sociologies in ver various national contexts in the Eastern Bloc. And here, Polish sociology is um, the utmost example. Uh, it has been an early mediator between Western, especially American sociology and post-Stalinist Marxist sociology in the making. And Polish sociologist version of open Marxism was appealing because it simultaneously enjoyed ideological legitimacy, as well as integrated up-to-date sociological theory and research techniques, which otherwise uh, would have been inaccessible for the rest of the Eastern Bloc. This was essential in the 1960s, but uh, exchanges with Polish sociology were mostly asymmetrical, um, particularly in the case of Polish and uh, Czech or Czechoslovak sociology. And by the 1970s, they were replaced by contacts forged throughout the internationalization of the social sciences and through East-West academic exchanges in particular. So this is what we know about collaboration in sociology in the Eastern Bloc. But what I would like to ask today, uh, and in my research more generally, is whether there was a sociology really specific to state socialism. Um, this question has been asked about communist psychiatry by Sarah Marx and Matt Savelli, and they have concluded that there were multiple psychiatries practiced across the period and the region, entangled through the complex circulation of knowledge and practices on both sides of the Iron Curtain. The same thing could easily be said about socialist sociologies in the plural. However, I think that there is value in taking serious the project of a socialist sociology as it was imagined and practiced and subverted in the long 1960s out of an awareness of the sociologists of uh, the synchronous, synchronous though asymmetrical development of the discipline at the peak of its popularity in Europe and North America. So ideas about the East-West divide, transnational collaboration, reflections on their own semi-peripheral conditions, condition, these were all constitutive parts of this project of socialist sociology and of the resulting knowledge and practices in ways that we have not yet fully appraised. I will now move to this um, project of socialist sociology. Um, I have put here on the left uh, a, a stamp from the uh, World Congress of Sociology that happened in Varna in 1970. This was a big event in the world of uh, uh, sociologists from state socialist countries because it was the first um, World Congress that was happening in a state socialist country. And there was a lot of debate um, uh, in the International Sociological Association about whether it is prudent uh, to organize the event there, but in the end it did happen. And as you see here, it was commemorated with this uh, with this stamp on the left. After the Congress in 1970, 
1971, the Bulgarian sociologist Zhivko Shavkov, who had been involved in the organization of the Congress uh, and then elected vice president of the International Sociological Association, he wrote to the Romanian Academy of Sciences and Political um, uh, of social and political sciences about a meeting of sociologists from socialist countries in preparation for the 1974 World Congress, which was going to happen in Toronto. And here you see um, this other image that I brought here is an image of a um, um, research coordinating committee, uh, which was led um, by um, uh, Sokolowska. She was a Polish, um, a, a Polish sociologist. And um, uh, I brought it here as an illustration of the kind of diversity um, um, that uh, sociology represented um, by by the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 1980s. 1970, 1974, we are still at the beginnings of this. So uh, sociologists from state socialist countries are just starting to be elected in um, leading positions uh, in the International Sociological Association. So Oshavkov was, um, was um, concerned, let's say, about the coming World Congress in Toronto. Uh, in April that uh, in April 1971, delegates of National Sociological Association and sociological institutes from Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, the GDR, Yugoslavia, and the Soviet Union arrived in Bucharest to discuss the best strategies for Marxist sociologists going forward. So the, the Congress in Varna had been <clears throat> Had, had gathered an unprecedented number of representatives from the Eastern Bloc. Uh, and one Bulgarian sociologist even, even called it uh, the most impressive ideological event in the world in 1917. Um, however, Nadal, I'm really, really sorry for interrupting you. We're running out of time a bit. Do you mind just make a, making the, the, the final points um, and then perhaps we could discuss it a bit more in the Q&A? I'm just looking at. Uh, sorry, I'm. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just. I was looking at the time, and I saw that uh, uh, this is my twenty-fourth minute. So that's why I was rather relaxed. But if you say that we should, um, we should go through this faster, then of course I can. No, no, definitely. So I just mean another five minutes or so. Okay, if it's another five minutes, then I will have to go really fast and I will have to skip the whole discussion of, uh, of um, um, uh, in Bucharest about what various sociologists from the Eastern Bloc consider to be the problem of socialist sociology and move directly to 19, uh, 1974. So what happened is that uh, socialist sociologists um, recognizing somehow their their methodological uh, problems, the problems of uh, lack of access to um, to um, um, uh, literature, um, they uh, they decided, uh, and also their lack of power within um, this international sociological association. What they decided was to um, uh, establish um, a parallel. Um, in a way, institutional structure. Um, this was um, an inter-academic research commission on the evolution of the social structure of socialist society, social plan on social planning and prognosis. It was established in 1974. And um, it brought together sociologists from um, all countries of the Eastern Bloc and from the Soviet Union. And it paralleled the International Sociological Association in the sense that it was also organized in uh, research or working groups. So as you saw in the previous um, in the previous photo, uh, and these working groups I brought here um, just um, a list of them to give you a sense of what the uh, sociological imaginary of um, of socialist uh, sociology was in 1974. So they were they were going to do work on the working class and the social structure of the socialist society, on intellectuals, on education, on the way of life and the system of values uh, of different social classes and groups, on demographic processes and social structure, on planning and prognosis, as well as um, um, they were they were supposed to kind of share research experience uh, in the study of processes of social development and each of these working group was um, was coordinated by one academy of science um, you see there in parentheses which and then 
um, they um, there was a there was a research plan for the entire research commission and then smaller research plans for each of these working groups and this is a history that is completely unresearched so we don't know what they were doing exactly uh, we nobody has looked into the publications that emerged from this but what i wanted to show you was that these would be the sources for uh, a history of um, socialist um, sociology as an uh, in a way an alternative project uh, to sociology as um, was uh, established at that moment in western europe on the other hand uh, not just an alternative um, in the sense of parallel project but interconnected in the ways that, that i tried to explain in my introduction so um, now I think what, uh, what I could do is just quickly give you a sense of the um, Romanian participation in this, which is what I know based on my own research. Uh, or what I could do is I, I could tell you what kind of, um, what kind of um, knowledge we could gain from looking at this uh, project of socialist sociology. So I think what I will do is I will tell you the three main reasons why I think that this project matters and then I will just in one minute summarize what the Romanian story tells us. So um, first of all there were intense negotiations among uh, around the working group themes so including how to exactly formulate a working group name um, and the issues raised by each country country's representatives and these negotiations can be the basis of mapping uh, sociological the, the sociological imaginary of socialist sociology so all political considerations um, taken into account so political considerations, by this I mean um, wanting or not wanting to align to the Soviet Union and so on, these debates were uh, not substantially different from the debates that were carried out around establishing working groups within the International Sociological Association. So my point here is that they should not be disconsidered just as representations of academic or scientific diplomacy, but they should be understood as ways to ground socialist sociology epistemically within a field of geopolitical contestation. This is my first point. My second point is that we should analyze really the outputs of this inter-academic collaboration. Uh, they were meant for international circulation. So these were edited volumes published in preparation for the World Congresses of Sociology. And that if we would do such an analysis of the output, this would allow us to get a sense of the way in which socialist sociology was conceived in relation to the sociology of Western capitalist countries and the global South. And this could be further compared to the self-positioning of socialist sociologists within the working groups of the International Sociological Association, allowing a fine-tuned account of the perception of epistemic inequalities and the construction of hierarchies of knowledge from the mid-1970s onwards. Uh, so just as a hypothesis, I would say that the participants' changing mapping of science, values, and aspiration invested in the socialist sociology project and their experience of its successes and failures hold the key to a historical grounding of late socialist and post-socialist ideas about epistemic inequalities, backwardness, and lagging behind in the social sciences. In turn, they inform how uh, the role of local experts was configured during the transition, the extent of their involvement in policy making and their relationship with the experts from international organizations from the West at the time. And finally, this is my third point and final point. Mm, these research pro projects, um, some of them were just a matter of putting together um, articles in an edited volume, but some actually involved collaborative work, the co-production of knowledge, either by devising shared methodology, by comparing results, by producing an overarching conceptual framework uh, or an analysis. So they document the possibilities for cooperation across national contexts at a moment when socialist internationalism was making a comeback as an alternative vision of globalization. On the other hand, they raised the question whether transnational forms of knowledge making were integrated into local scientific practice, so back home, and whether they became or not sources of critical analysis locally. And this is where the Romanian uh, case study would have come into play, and I will summarize it really in one sentence. And um, Romanian sociologists who participated in this project of socialist sociology were the ones that did not have access 
to um, uh, international exchange programs abroad. So they, they did not go to the United States. They did not go uh, with IREX scholarships. They did not go to France. They did not go to West Germany. So for these sociologists that did not have access to the West, um, participation in these regional forms of collaboration really mattered. Uh, it mattered because as I could see in the Romanian context, it offered a sort of extra leverage point in this negotiation between the regime's um, um, outward image of, um, of independence um, from the Soviet Union, so the Romanian regimes, and at the same time, the increase, increasing nationalization of national culture, including um, social scientific work. So, what I, what I could see by looking at the Romanian sociologist participation in this collaborative project was that, um, that this kind of regional expertise was used as a bargaining chip in order to neg negotiate their own position. On the one hand, they were using the language of everyday Marxism, Leninism, particularly in the Romanian case, this issue of social homogenization. On the, one, on the other hand, they were using this collaboration in the region, pro, regional project in order to still produce knowledge that was valuable and that could um, pose critical questions about the social structure of um, society at that point, specific, specifically about growing social inequalities. On this, I will end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so very much, Dr. Hinku. Thank you so much. That was really um, insightful and I'm sure is going to raise quite a few questions. As a matter of fact, we already have the first question from Dr. Gautam Chakrabarti. Uh, perfect. And over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tokarski. Uh, and the second pronunciation is just right. So um, I just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Hinku, if that's a strong C, right? Yeah. So uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this paper, which interests me at a number of levels, so I've been working on the cultural Cold War, also from my last position in Munich. So there's a book coming out, co-edited with Christopher Baum, and, and myself uh, performing the Cold War. Recently, I also, we also wrote, in fact, in August company, Professor Zhuk is here, I see. So he also contributed to this uh, collaborative essay on reframing the cultural Cold War, 20th anniversary of uh, uh, who paid the piper. Uh, so I, my question comes, as you might imagine, from the cultural Cold War perspective. So perhaps as a cultural studies person, I'm looking at uh, these organizations of sociologists, uh, philosophers, uh, linguists, um, ethnologists, as various mobilizations at the governmental level, at the level of governmentality, at the level of policymaking on both sides of the Iron Curtain, as attempts to steer if not capture public debates in various cutting edge disciplines or what was seen as various cutting edge disciplines. So the congresses and the organizations and the exchanges you're discussing and the attempts at creating alternative visions in the social sciences, one could say that similar trajectories were happening in theater studies, for example. I mean, it's, a, it's absolute Viviana Jakob, Jacobs from, uh, from Romania who I think worked in Bulgaria also. She's worked on this, as you might know. So what, what, what you're seeing is at various levels, at various stages of uh, uh, intellectual discourse or public discourse, the socialist world, the second world is trying to create alternative structures. My question would be uh, a bit provocative. Would you say that uh, in Romania specifically and Eastern Europe in general, um, the Ost Bloc in general, sociology was not only seen as an important discipline to critically revisit socialist society back home and also create alternative patterns for thinking ethnology, thinking social relationships, but also as a discipline which had the potential to mold public imagination, to structure public discourse at a global level. So what I'm trying to say, was sociology seen in the quote-unquote Eastern world 
also as a potent as a discipline with cultural political potential with globalist cultural potential political potential thank you so much multu mesh <laughs> thank you so much for this question and thank you for uh, for telling me about your project which sounds fascinating and i agree that the story of sociology goes very well together with the story of many other cultural uh, domains including theater um to your question directly well, whether sociology had a mission of molding the public uh, public ideas. Okay, I, I think I simplify your point, but still, I don't think so. So I think that sociology had more of a, a state building and governance um, uh, mission uh, under state socialism, or at least this is what I see from the case of Romania and from what I know from the rest of the Eastern Bloc. So um, uh, it it uh, it. We imagined itself, itself in terms of expertise. There was also, um, I think, a critical, um, a critical strand uh, that came a bit from this Marxist humanist, Marxist revisionist tradition, uh, which had more of a, um, um, I think, of an ethos of kind of like system systemic uh, criticism but uh, in principle the idea was for sociology to be some sort of like expert science in service of the state in service of state building um, and this this you see in the kind of projects that they were conducting on the other hand if you kind of like noticed in that list of uh, themes there were uh, some topics that had this potential that you are mentioning such as this way of life this research into way of life quality of life that could become research into social inequalities, which it did in some parts. So this kind of like systemic criticism of state socialism, or it could become something more kind of a bit more problematic of, um, of a way of mapping uh, social realities in order to kind of uh, mold them in the way that, that you explained, uh, to mold them for purposes of socialist edification, this kind of enlightenment educational ethos. Right, so I would say that that um, yeah, to your question, I would say a, a soft no, <laughs> with uh, with some kind of additions of of kind of domains where it was indeed possible to to do this. But I don't think that sociology ever became, except in moments of reformism, like nineteen fifty six Hungary, nineteen sixty eight. Um, Czechoslovakia, maybe Solidarity Poland, it never became uh, that kind of uh, ideological um, science, right? So it, uh, it never aspired to that. And when it tried, it was kind of very, very rapidly um, uh, put to an end. Great, fantastic. Well, as the moderator of the panel, I have uh, I had the privilege of, of reading uh, Dr. Hinkus um, pre-circulated draft, and I, I found it really uh, illuminating in many ways. And uh, again, because of the limitations of time, sadly, we do not have the chance to speak about all of those things. But something that I was really fascinated by is uh, as I was reading your paper, just to give give everyone a taste of. Uh, how much more you could say about it is uh, this empirical study uh, that was attempted in 1979, uh, essentially trying to survey uh, and, and study uh, the data about 1,300 workers uh, in, in the Bucharest fact uh, factories as this pilot study, essentially looking, as far as I understand, at the erasure of the uh, gap or the difference between the uh, the manual labor and intellectual labor and looking towards the questions of stratification in the face of uh, the increasing automization and mechanization and I was really fascinated by by the results of this uh, analysis uh, which were that in fact it seems like this stratification was internalized uh, so much was so much internalized that even this technological development did not affect uh, the uh, ideological education or ideological worldview, if I may put it this way. Uh, uh, even even though the te technological development was happening at the same time, so that just of course shows us the um, uh, importance of ideology there. So I just thought that in the first place. Uh, whether uh, you could also comment on that 
study and whether to you uh, that tells us something about ideology and the relationship with sociology as well at that point, even though that's already 1979, of course. And then another question that I had um, in this respect was the um, question of the content of that sociology. So, of course, it is so elucidating for us to see that actually the institutional framework, the institutional networks weren't that different from their Western counterparts. And I suppose, as far as I understood, that is an important part of your point. But uh, again, in, in the pre-circulated draft, um, I also appreciated uh, you mentioning that the two main strands in this, uh, what we could uh, tentatively call um, socialist sociology were humanist Marxist and structural functionalist. And I was wondering whether perhaps you could comment as well on, on the content of that sociology and whether, you know, coming back to the question of backwardness, whether in some ways that sociology might have been even a bit more progressive than the Western counterparts of, of the sociological schools, especially in the study of class, because that was so much of the focus in the Soviet Union and in the countries of, of uh, people's democracy. I actually had a couple more questions, but I think I'm going to just leave it there. And I can see that uh, we already have a couple more questions coming in. So um, yeah, if you could just come make a couple of comments about those, I would be very, yeah. very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much for reading my paper so attentively and for your insightful questions. I will be brief on the first. I think you did a very good job at summarizing what this study was about. So there's not much more I wanted to say about it, just that I didn't think of it in terms of ideology versus sociology, like I try to uh, I, I, I try to not do this as much as I can, although it is clear that, that the pressure of ideology was always there. So what I do is that I kind of first set the stage of what this pressure was, like what were the kind, like how sociology was planned, right? Sociology was a planned science, like all other sciences. It was supposed to develop based on like a, a set of themes. So that is what I see as the ideology part of sociology, is what I call everyday Marxism-Leninism. In this case, the ideology part was the fact that uh, with the scientific technological revolution and automation, uh, people will experience more freedom, less alienation, right? And the science part, what you described, is that um, uh, by uh, working within this uh, theme, so by working very much within the ideological uh, uh, kind of um, ideas of the day, they were showing that what is happening is actually the opposite, that uh, that uh, that workers who, um, very few of them, by the way, who do work with the most advanced machines so show signs of even more alienation, because now they're even more removed from their object uh, of work. Um, they uh, and they're bored and, uh, you know, like they're less um, le less involved in the process. So this is what I see as the interplay, right? So like not just resistance or, but there, there was, um, you know, this was a complicated way of working within existing um, th themes, but doing something that was or not critical. On the second question of structural functionalism, Marxism, critical Marxism, um, whether it was or not more progressive. Uh, it's an interesting point. Um, I think in the 1970s, sociologists from Eastern Europe were convinced that they were more progressive in the sense exactly because they were still doing, you know, like class, class research and social, well, he didn't call it social stratification research, that was the bourgeois term, but they were looking at social inequalities uh, and, and um, they were convinced that, that they are more progressive in the sense that they actually care about uh, the human aspects of work. Um, and um, I don't disagree with them. On the other hand, they were fascinated by structural functionalism. Um, they were fascinated by the, you know, like up-to-date methodologies from America. So um, how I try to explain this is that 
there wasn't, you know, like there weren't parallel things, um, but there was a lot of back and forth of um, of um, what what they thought they understood of Western science. Uh, there was also a fascination of Western social scientists in um, Eastern European social science. So you had a lot of American anthropologists, for instance, coming uh, to the Eastern Bloc doing research. Most of them had some sort of less leftist aspirations. So. Um, I think there was like this kind of back and forth or like, feedback loops, like the way I like to call them, uh, which made uh, so it, it made it makes it difficult to say what was more progressive. But definitely, there was a lot of critical um, critical sentiment among socialist sociologists about the dehumanizing aspects of structural functionalist analysis in the West at the time. I will leave it at this. Fantastic, thank you so much. So we have a couple more questions. The first one, um, giving the floor to Andriy Portno. Uh, thank you. So first of all, uh, dear Dema, thank you very much for this presentation. I think it was just great, uh, both in terms of uh, you know pictures and what you've told us. I have a very simple question, if I may, maybe even I'm wrong. So please correct me, I'll be very happy <laughs> to be wrong here. So my let's say, maybe not even just impression, but my, let's say, uh, limited memories of the Soviet university or post-Soviet university uh, tells me that there was no sociology at all. So sociology as the very term was considered to be like non-Soviet, yeah, bourgeois, Western, yeah? M maybe I'm wrong, again, maybe I'm wrong here, so please correct me. Why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because uh, I'm really curious if this very term sociology was kind of accepted as neutral, let's say in Bulgarian, in Romanian, in Polish tradition, then it's already makes a big difference to the Soviet one. And if so, then maybe we could also like move further and speculate on, you know, on those kind types of like interrelations or non simultaneities between Soviet Soviet. Uh, social science, and let's say socialist Polish, socialist Romanian, socialist Bulgarian science, but maybe not. So I'm just curious how 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 you see that as a real specialist in the field. And thanks a lot again for your talk. Yes, thank you. So I think what you are describing is this idea of socialist sociologies, right? This is the the so the very well funded assumption that. Actually, sociology as it developed in various national case studies because of the fact that they were ultimately quite isolated from each other, it was very specific to the local context, to the connections of the local scientists to the West or not. Um, and uh, I think, so as I said, I think, I think there, is, there is real reason to think, think in those terms. On the other hand, I think what socialist sociology in the singular um, is not it is not necessarily a real thing so i don't think i've ever seen a document that says socialist sociology on the other hand it was a project and it was an aspiration right it was a transnational aspiration that was transnational not just out of internationalist feelings but maybe even sometimes against uh, kind of like common sense internationalism uh, but as a way to kind of then have leverage on the in, the in the local context as well. I'm not, I don't know about sociology in the Soviet Union, unfortunately. I thought I knew that there was an institute specifically for sociology in Moscow. Uh, maybe I am wrong. I will I will have to go back to uh, Schlappentoch and <laughs> read his book and see. But um, uh, sociology was used as a term everywhere in the Eastern Bloc. There were institutes with the name of Institute of Sociological Research. There was a short period when, when it was not called sociology, but it was called concrete social research, a concrete empirical research. Uh, and I think this surely came from the Soviet Union. So it was so the, the way of terming it in this way, but it was very short. And then sociology became everywhere and the accepted discipline name. But you are very right that, for instance, in Romania in the 1980s, you wouldn't have, have found sociology anymore because the institute, because the um, discipline was this, this institutionalized in 1977. So there is also a history of not just institutionalizing, but deinstitutionalizing sociology with different chronologies in the Eastern Bloc, in the Soviet Union. This would be nice to to discuss as well. Brilliant. And then Claudia Date wanted to ask a question as well. 
Yeah, um, maybe I, I can at first uh, comment, uh, Andri, on your question as for the GDR, because I was a student of sociology at the last years of the GDR. So I can definitely say that sociology existed in the GDR, but it was a um, subject which was considered extremely close to scientific communism. So they were formed into one, one institute. So the subject was always considered as one which is very closely linked to state policy and to all this um, <clears throat> communist ideology. So that's, that's for this GDR part. And um, as far as uh, my questions are concerned, I would like to ask two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is about uh, the scheme you gave um, about the different uh, types of sociology and um, uh, you, you've mentioned uh, the revisionist type and the Soviet type and also the distorted type. And this notion of distortion, it gives quite an evaluation of what it was. And I was curious um, how, um, how this notion of distortion came into the categorization. What was uh, the reason for that? And uh, my second question is uh, concerned with the language. Uh, you spoke about uh, this uh, socialist sociology project and uh, you gave this um, table of different topics and uh, spoke about the discussions. And I was wondering which language uh, the, uh, the researchers use and uh, did term has, has term terminology been a part of this project? So um, if they tried to develop uh, um, so a socialist sociology. There must have been also questions about uh, what the notions would be like and in, in which language that they try to establish this. Because I mean, we have a very distinguished language of sociology in German, in French, in English as well. And sometimes it's not comparable one to each other. Yeah, that's, that's, that would be my question. Okay, thank you very much, very much, Claudia. And thank you also as well for all your help with organizing this conference. I wanted to mention this. Um, uh, to your questions. So your first question about a distorted type. So I want to clarify again that that is not my um, terminology. So uh, this is uh, some research, research that was done by Mikhail Voreshek, who is a, a Czech uh, historian, and he wrote a whole book about this. And uh, that, that is um, a classification that he offered in an article. It is not a perfect classification. I agree with you that the language sounds um, um, even pejorative, um, but uh, I think it, I, why I presented it is a useful classification to show that this idea of all Eastern European countries lagging behind all Western European countries is fundamentally flawed. And uh, the distorted type, luckily it's pejorative, but not towards Eastern European countries. So maybe we can accept it in that sense. It is, the distorted type is, uh, it was meant there to show exactly that, that what we think of the ideal Western um, kind of uh, institutionalization model is actually uh, the extreme minority uh, and what is a distorted type is distorted by what? By political circumstances, as in Spain or in Greece or Iceland and so on. Um, so distorted, I think, should be understood in this context of showing actually that the ideal model is, is, um, is, is, is marginal, that that is the actual outlier, is the ideal model. And the distorted understood it with quotation marks. And on your second question, um, about the language. I think this is a very important question. Uh, much of the discussions were happening in Russian. Uh, so I think I would actually assume that most discussions were happening in Russian everywhere. They, these people met, they met throughout the Eastern Bloc and in Moscow, but I think the lingua franca was Russian. This is important because in Romania, not everyone <laughs> spoke Russian in the 19, late, late 1970s. Right, so uh, a young sociologist trained in '72 uh, would not have been as proficient, uh, which means, uh, and with this I will end, which means that it really makes a difference to whom was about who was participating in this project of socialist sociology in terms of in generational and uh, biographical terms. Right, so 
again. And you see this when you ask. So I did interviews with sociologists. And if you ask somebody that is a bit younger, then they will tell you this project, this project was useless. We didn't get anything out of it. We were just going there, but it was pro forma. It was a lot of like posturing and um, performance. We didn't get much of it. If you ask a bit older sociologists who are not as old as to be well institutionalized, but not that young as to have access to Western institutions, then for them it really mattered. And they, of course, they, they were still very proficient in Russian. But thank you, this is an important question. And I think I will have to, to think about it in much more detail as I move forward with the project. Okay, thank you very much. Fantastic. Okay, so moving on to the second talk today and it is my pleasure to present Dr. Roland Tsutkovsky. He will talk to us about backwardness, control and global governance, the USSR, cybernetics and the Cold War. And before that a couple of words uh, about Dr. Tsutkovsky. Um, Roland finished his studies in medieval and modern history and Russian and Czech studies in Frankfurt am Main and Prague uh, in 2000. In 2005, Dr. Tsvetkovsky completed his PhD in Eastern European history at the University of Cologne, writing about modernity through acceleration, space and mobility in Tsarist Russia, published in 2006. Between 2006 and 2019, Dr. Tsvetkovsky was a research assistant at the chair of Eastern European history at the University of Cologne. And since 2019, he has been a private docent at the same university. And since 2020, Dr. Tsvetkovsky has also been the managing editor of the Historische Zeitschrift and, and, and translator. And importantly, in 2019, Dr. Tsvetkovsky finished his habilitation project entitled Collection, Power, Revolution the art museum in Russia and the Soviet Union between 1900 and 1940. Uh, Dr. Tsvetkovsky is the author of a number of publications and the topics that he is especially interested in and that the publications have to do with are Imperial Russian history, museum studies, history of knowledge, imperial corporations and history of ethnographic knowledge. So over to you, Dr. Zwitkowski. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bogdan, for this kind introduction. And thanks, Andri, once again, for this invitation from this kind one to have the, the opportunity to take part in this very diverse and nevertheless um, interesting conference. I just want to share. Do you have it? OK. Okay. In my presentation, I would like to focus on a certain aspect of non-simultaneity, namely that of backwardness. This topos has a long, often broken and very powerful tradition for Eastern Europe and especially for Russia, a tradition which basically began with Peter the Great. This concept was brought to Russia from the outside, but also used from within time and again to describe a deficit state in political, economic, and particularly in cultural terms. Backwardness has two significant characteristics. Firstly, it is a concept of temporalization because it serves to locate the object in question in a temporal context and, above all, to focus on its future. Its future, as it will probably be, should be, or could be. On the other hand, it is a term that presupposes a value judgment and thus also a comparison, a relation. Anyone who takes backwardness into account, thus also implies a certain normativity, which makes a diagnosis of backwardness possible in the first place. Backwardness therefore means that one not only assumes a consecutive succession of past, present and future as a framework condition, but that in this progression in time, one also suspects a specific force, which is referred to 
idea, which, which is referring to ideas such as development and progress. All this can be observed not only for Tsarist Russia, where research has widely discussed the topics of backwardness. It applies equally to the Soviet Union, and here, especially after the death of Stalin, possibly much more. In the seven-year plan of 1959, Nikita Khrushchev issued, under the banner of systemic competition, the unmistakable, the unmistakable slogan, catch up and overtake. In the sensitive area of consumption, for example, he promised that the US would be overtaken in just 10 years. Of course, the first secretary did not use the term backwardness, but the connection is obvious. The difference that Khrushchev opens up refers not so much to the absence of, say, certain consumer goods, but to the finding that the Soviet Union and the US find themselves in their relation to each other in a state of non simultaneity. This non simultaneity, and this is Khrushchev's implicit statement would first be neutralized in the near future by catching up with the US and then be changed to the opposite by overtaking them. I would now like to show this correlation in using the specific example of cybernetics in the period from the 1950s to the 1980s. Cybernetics, as its founder Norbert Wiener put it, had started as a quote, signs of regulation, control, and communication in the living organism and in the machine, end of quote. It was a science of control and emphasized effective planning processes. Cybernetics was the promise of being able to model the future. The specificity of this example is that during the Cold War, systemic competition, the steadfast belief in progress and the irrepressible shared optimism to shape the future formed a liaison in this science. In my opinion, cybernetics stood for a symbol of how non-simultaneities were transformed into political and technological expectations of simultaneity, which were installed and coordinated as block-spanning epistemic values. In the following, I would like to discuss these three theses. Especially, first, especially against the background of the Cold War, systemic competition can be interpreted and uh, interpret, inter, uh, interpreted as, as an indication of, a non uh, of non simultaneity. And this applies both in self perception and in external attribution. Backward were those who fell behind in the technological race. Nevertheless, backward, backwardness was not only to be equated with a defeat, but above all, it meant that one had lost the claim to normativity. However, this claim to normativity did not result from technological progress, but primarily from ideology. From this follows the second point. With its formal mathematical models, cybernetics formulated a claim to control, but in the USSR, this challenged the party's leading role. In the Soviet Union, the overcoming of backwardness, that is the cybernetic acceleration of development and progress through the optimization of processes, as well as through the long-term planning of processes, had paradoxically been thwarted politically. And thirdly, cybernetics fit into the pattern of system competition, but at the same time, it broke out of it. On the one hand, its application promised a competitive advantage. On the other, it provided, in the sense of a universal science, a specific vocabulary with the help of which common interests could be formulated. Cybernetics became a platform on which simultaneity could be established and allowed to define problems on a global scale. But still, simultaneity was not automatically synonymous with the, ab with the abolition of backwardness. To explain my assumptions, I will proceed in five steps. First, I will introduce you to, briefly, to Wiener's concept of cybernetics. Then, I turn to the dynamics of development of the scientific debates about cybernetics which fit into the logic of the Cold War. In the third step, I, I examine the Soviet attempt to make cybernetics usable for the planned economy. And then fourth, I will discuss the aspect of global intercommunication and futurology. In the end, I outline some perspe perspectives, especially in connection with the complex of global government. Norbert Wiener's book, 
was published in 1948. What was it actually about? Basically, he shifted the entire coordinate system of the exact sciences. Mechanics, energetics, and thermodynamics were no longer considered guiding concepts, but information, logic, and symbol processing. Cybernetics deals with the registration of communication and control processes in systems and organizations of all kinds. The basic assumption is that biological, technical, and social systems are similar in certain features and are structured by the transmission of information. The task of cybernetics is to map and to analyze the dynamic interactions between the individual elements of the system on the one hand, and the system and its environment on the other hand, in so-called control loop mechanisms. The control loop is the central paradigm because it describes the self-control of a system through permanent readjustment and realignment. I can briefly illustrate this with the example of navigation, which is from the book, by the way, uh, from a Soviet book from the early 60s, in the translation in the GDI, in the German translation. The ship system consists of the captain, the decision-making authority, the pilot who determines the actual state, the helmsman determines the target state, and the rower represents the execution instance. A decision to change the direction of the ship is therefore made by the communication of the individual elements of the system ship, as well as by the communication of the system ship with its environment water. It is crucial that due to the constant feedbacks between all elements, the system becomes capable of learning. And this in turn means that its adaptability depends to a large extent on how much information it can absorb and process. This is the basic idea, by the way, of computer science and of informatics. Wiener's book triggered an enormous international echo. The possible applications of cybernetics seemed unlimited. As late as 1948, a French reviewer was even expecting so-called government machines, machine à gouverner, which would be soon exercising political power. The Soviet reception of cybernetics was in diametrical opposition to the developments in the US. When the US and other Western countries were initially caught by a cybernetic euphoria, a rigorous rejection determined the Soviet position. This was primarily due to the fact that the counter campaign, which lasted until 1945, uh, sorry, 1954, did not see cybernetics as a scientific theory, but as a philosophical doctrine of the opponent. Nevertheless, the political leadership set up its first military data center in secrecy in Moscow in 1954. The official strengthening of cybernetics began with the onset of the thaw and coincided with the fading of cybernetic enthusiasm in the USA. Arnold Kolman, a Czech Soviet mathematician and notorious informer of the 1930s and 40s, was the first to side with the idea of cybernetics publicly. In an essay published in 1955, he argued that it was a mistake to assume that the opponent would be concerned with senseless ideas. He thus expressed the fear that the USA may have put themselves in a better position vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union due to the research they had been conducting over several years. Coleman's essay instantly triggered a wave of publications on cybernetics in the USSR. The Soviet scientists now started justifying the adoption of the opponent's concept by pointing to the fact that they only used its objective mathematical core, but not its ideological shell. Consideration was especially given to, the delegate, to delegating rational decision-making to machines in order to exclude human uncertainties as much as possible. The concept of the machine now ruled the discussion. The new, catch up, the new catchphrase was automatization, and that meant computerization. But this machine euphoria was by no means limited to scientists. The highest political bodies of the USSR also followed suit. Already in January 1956, 
a Ministry of Tool Building and Automatization was established, which was followed in 1957 by the foundation of a cybernetic faculty in Akadiem Garadok. And at the beginning of 1959, in the Academy of Sciences, under the direction of the Naval Admiral and High Frequency Engineer, Axel Berg, a so-called cybernetic council was set up, which from then on coordinated cybernetic research throughout the USSR. Shortly thereafter, Axel Berg also initiated the book series, Cybernetics in the Service of Communism. The first volume appeared in 1961. In the USA, the Soviet development was now regarded as a matter of great concern, so that the CIA set up a special task force in 1961. As early as October 6, 1962, its head, John J. Ford, spoke of a serious threat posed by Soviet cybernetic research. And Robert Schlesinger, Kennedy's personal advisor, warned in the same month that already, quote, by 1970, the USSR may have a radically new production technology involving total enterprises or complexes of industries managed by closed loop feedback control employing self-teaching computers, end of quote. And if the American negligence of cybernetics continued, Schlesinger concluded, quote, we are finished, end of quote. Immediately after, in the USA, immense funds were poured into cybernetics and especially into research on artificial intelligence. At its heart was the US Department of Defense with its Advanced Research Project Agency, ARPA for short, and much more important, the Information Processing Techniques Office, IPTO for short, headed by Joseph Licklider. Licklider's research focused on establishing the computer as a central communication medium. As early as 1963, he insisted that all computer systems of the IPTO be standardized in order to connect the individual data centers with each other. Dick Leider and his successor, Robert Taylor, viewed the computer as the communication device to unite research groups to what they called super community. The first large computer network, the Pentagon so-called ARPANET, was put into operation in 1968 at the instigation of Licklider and Taylor and is considered the forerunner of the internet. The American resumption of cybernetic research, which soon assumed shape of informatics, referred to developments in the USSR in which the mathematician Viktor Glushkov had mainly been involved. As his 1982 obituary in the New York Times read, he was the uncrowned king of cybernetics. In the 1960s, Rushkov had focused on the automatization of the economic planning and management system in the USSR and had initiated the so-called statewide automatized computing and information processing system. August for short. The Soviet planned economy had been showing deficits for a long time. The central planning authorities in particular suffered from a glaring coordination problem. This brought Khrushchev to an interim decentralization of the economy in order to synchronize production and demand better. Khrushchev now envisaged the establishment of a state network of data centers to remove these shortcomings on a technical level. To him, the use of the so-called calculating machine was inevitable because it operated with a completely, quote, with a completely mathematical model of both the company and its external relations, end of quote, which allowed to assess the proposed decisions rapidly. Within 20 minutes, Rushkov claimed, it should be possible to answer any question throughout the Union, the Soviet Union. Glushkov thus held out the prospect of a fully automatized planning process in which the plan could be corrected incessantly and in which production could be adapted both to political guidelines and global conditions. What is particularly remarkable about this was on the one hand that computer networks were to be used for civilian purposes for the first time worldwide. And on the other hand, that the economy was transformed into an exact science. 
for the automatization of the economy, as it was argued, made clear the real advantage that communism could offer, and that is centralized control plus a planned economy. Accordingly, Nikita Khrushchev called for the use of automatized control techniques for the planned economy in the plenum of the Central Committee in November 1962. And so in the same month, the first deputy prime minister of the USSR, Alexei Kosygin, met with Viktor Glushkov in Kiev to discuss the possibilities of automatizing economic management. This was the birth of August. The Politburo officially sanctioned this project in May 1963. Now, the mathematization of economic planning actually took place. The Central Institute of Economic Mathematics in Moscow, SEMI for short, was in charge of this. Here, models were developed that promised a consistent control system and therefore, as it was called, optimal planning. Such a computer network gave rise to the idea that the entire Soviet economy was an interconnected enterprise in which decisions could be made in real time and could be managed from a central location. However, Ogas could not be implemented as the cyberneticists had intended. This was due to the fact that the computer network signified an obvious menace for several stakeholders. For instance, the employees of the Soviet planning authority, Gosplan, as well as many plant managers opposed this project. They deemed the ogres a threat to, the, to their own position and saw in it a considerable reduction of their scope of action. But the party also had also become uh, attentive when it realized that an automatization of economic management actually meant. The party interpreted the transfer of decisions to machines, which were programmed by economic mathematicians, as a clear challenge of its supremacy because economic decisions were originally made in the planning state administration. Cybernetics, the party argued, disguised as a mere technological innovation, would discreetly take control of the economy and would presume to occupy the party's most official territory. The party could hardly allow this. Therefore, in 1966, the political leadership decided not to introduce a union-wide computer network, but to, implement in, but to implement it in each ministry for itself. As a result, control within, within the ministries was centralized, but the coordination of decision-making uh, of um, the coordination of decision-making processes, especially on an upper level with the planning authority goes plan, failed to materialize. However, it was not only the mutual distrust that pushed the two superpowers in their cybernetic research. This was also due to the global dimension of computer networks, which came to light in parallel. In 1966, US President Lyndon Johnson suggested that American and Soviet scientists should cooperate to address problems that resulted from the automatized industrial production, the unequal distribution of resources, and the increasing environmental pollution. Mac George Bundy, the national security advisor to Kennedy and Johnson, was assigned to organize this cooperation. In the USSR, Bundy connected German Vishian, deputy chairman of the State Committee for Science and Technology. In view of the global significance of the problem, both agreed not to limit the cooperation to the superpowers, but to expand it multilaterally. And so the first overall meeting was organized in Moscow in June 1969, where an Institute for Global Intercommunication was founded, named the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, IASA for short. Among other things, it was decided to staff the institutional administration on equal terms with Soviet and American experts. Luxembourg Palace near Vienna was designated as headquarters of the Institute. The Yaza had 12 founding members. Besides the superpowers, it also included Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, the GDR, but also Canada and Japan, and began its work in 1972. The American mathematician Howard Rafer became the director, German Vishiani, was appointed as chairman of the Institute's Council. At a conference in 1974, the IASA medi meditated on the possibilities of electronic data processing. The envisaged intercommunication 
of the institutes of computing technology and cybernetics in each country was based above all on the idea that international research should be stimulated and coordinated more intensively. They expected, <clears throat> they expected that this would imply the formation of large networks of researchers, which involved far more than the scientists based at those institutes. The IASA had come to the conclusion that top level research could no longer be conducted on a national level. From the mid 1970s, the IASA worked on setting up a data network between Budapest, Bratislava, Moscow, Paris, and Pisa. And in July 1977, the first transatlantic data connection between Austria, Poland, the USSR, and the USA came into operation. Beside the interconnecting of sciences in order to solve global problems, the IASA had another mission. Its objective consisted also in elaborating methods that, quote, predict, assess, and manage the social and other repercussions of scientific and technological developments, end of quote. Thus, the IASA fit into a larger context in which cybernetics served as the basis for a scientifically sound future science, the so-called futurology, which had already been established in the 1960s. In the USSR, futurology initially moved within ideological boundaries. The party program of 1961, for example, set a planning period in which the material as well as technical basis for communism should be laid by 1980. Therefore, the protagonists thought about how social consequences of technical scientific progress could be assessed and how political economic developments could be anticipated. A separate branch of research quickly emerged, the so-called prognostics or forecasting. As early as January 1967, the Department of Social Prognostics was founded at the Academy of Sciences. Its head was Igor Bestuzhev Lada, the central figure of Soviet futurology. In 1969, there were already more than 1,000 such of such institutes of prognostics in the USSR, which were mainly concerned with economic planning. The task was, as Bestuzhev Lada put it in 1968, that the socialist bloc had to find Marxist answers to those questions that Western futurologists were also engaged with. And Bestuzhev Lada knew exactly what these questions were and how the Western futurologists dealt with them because he himself was intimately involved in international futurology. For example, he was a member of Mankind 2000, an internationally acting group in the 1960s, combining peace movement, peace and future research. In September 1967, its first conference was held in Oslo. A total of 65 scientists from 17 countries participated, including the Stuge of Wadden. On the agenda, one could find topics such as peace and development, which had to be analyzed with methods of system, systems analysis, prognostics, scenario writing, and computer simulation. The aim of the Oslo conference was to discuss the organizational consolidation of international futurology, and also to ponder on how the knowledge of the future could be made available to politics. In 1969, the discussions were published in an anthology. But a clearly Marxist answer in scientific forecasting proved difficult, not least because of such entanglements. Therefore, what can be observed in the course of the 1970s is a gradual shift from an ideologically to a globally conceived future based on cooperation in prognostic work. It is true. The Club of Rome's report on the limits of growth in 1972 had first triggered fierce polemical reactions in the Soviet Union. For reaching the limits of growth, as the report obviously suggested, was certainly no option in the Soviet plan. However, the fact that Soviet scientists were actually involved in the Club of Rome's development of computer simulated analysis was suppressed discreetly. And the fact that the aforementioned German Dvishyani, deputy chairman of the State Committee of, for Science of Technology of the Soviet Union, had been in close contact since the mid 1960s with the later founders of the Club of Rome, and that he even was a member of it, was also generously overlooked. But as early as 1977, the environmental study 
Global 2000, which had been initiated by US President Jimmy Carter, found a favorable reception in Moscow. This could be seen in the party's approach to those scientists who openly committed themselves to the environmental study, as the example of the later Nobel Prize winner in physics, Pyotr Leonidovich Kapitsa shows. He said that, Kapitsa said that it was simply wrong to tackle problems of resource exploitation and pollution separately and on an ideological basis. With such a wholehearted statement, he would probably have run into trouble a decade earlier. Now he got away unmolested. But the political leadership of the USSR had already softened its tone before, because in 1976, the old Union Scientific Institute for Systems Research, NISI, for short, had been founded at the Academy of Sciences. This institute was concerned with demographic, political, economic, and ecological long-time forecasts for different parts of the world and was, above all, the Soviet branch of the IASA. Its head was German Grishian. Now come to a kind of conclusion, kind of epilogue. As we have seen, cybernetic terms such as transmission of uh, sorry, such as transmission of information, intercommunication, and optimal planning have defined a new epistemic horizon since the 1950s. They promised to nullify non-simultaneity, and that is backwardness, through their objective mathematical models. This possible application, the possible applications of cybernetics seemed unlimited. I've shown you the important fields, uh, such important fields as economic planning, data processing, and future modeling. At the same time, however, cybernetics was deeply ambivalent pre precisely because of its content indifferent character. On the one hand, the Communist Party saw itself threatened by the cybernetic control capabilities. On the other hand, cybernetics helped to form supranational scientific alliances because its new vocabulary revolving around regulation, control, and planning also opened up the possibility to pose strategic questions about future developments in global dimensions. Nevertheless, one has to be cautious. Despite the outline success stories, the enthusiasm for control and supranational planetary intercommunication, which both manifested themselves in the new cybernetic parlance, nevertheless took place and developed always with reservations. In particular, I would like to address the aspect, the aspect of global modeling. It is still unclear how global modeling actually interacted with the ongoing system competition. For instance, in 1978, the aforementioned German Vishiani, one of the prominent Soviet protagonists in the history of these block overarching entanglements, spoke as a matter of course of the need for global modeling, but did not want to retreat from ideological opposition. In the Vaprosi Philosophy, he wrote, it is quite obvious that global modeling must become a field of ideological debate because it is associated with relatively concrete ideas that have nothing less in mind than the future of humanity. And in the process, two opposing ideas inevitably clash. That is the communist and the capitalist. And even as the term global problem established itself in the USSR in the early 1980s, referring to the very problems I spoke of earlier. This obviously did not detract from the idea that a joint solution of these problems did not necessarily presume the same foundations. This seems to continue beyond the dividing line of 1991. Of course, Putin's increasingly authoritarian style in the last two decades made sure that in international terms, the divide became deeper and deeper. Not few contemporaries meant to discern in Putin's conservative policy the wish to revive a kind of systemic competition in the spirit of the Cold War. But in fact, something similar can already be observed in the 1990s. After the implosion of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation tried to position itself as a global player, especially in turning to the Western world. During this time, Russian diplomacy persistently advocated the concept of a multipolar and multilateral world order, especially in the fields of the so-called internet governance and information security. It campaigned relentlessly for, 
uh, for ensuring that all states should have equal access to information or security concepts for information, and that these states should continue to maintain their state sovereignty in these joint processes. In 1992, for example, at the General Assembly of the International Telecommunication Union, a special organization of the United Nations that is concerned with mainly technical aspects of telecommunications, the representatives of the Russian Federation opine that all countries have, re have recognized the importance of telecommunications, which consists in safeguarding the interests of the state on an international level. At the second uh, General uh, Assembly of the International Telecommunications Union, two years later in 1994, the representatives of the Russian Federation stressed that each country must retain its, quote, sovereign right to organize telecommunications. But in so, end of quote, but in so doing, the International Telecommunication Union must not lose its extraordinary role in regulating international telecommunications matters worldwide. The Russian foreign minister, Igor Ivanov, made a similar Janus faced attempt when he presented the resolution to the United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan in September 98. 1998. In this resolution, he called upon the international community to place information security atop of the United Nations agenda. This was preceded by a declaration co-authored by the US and Russia, in which the two states described themselves as natural partners who guaranteed peace and stability. This natural partnership also consisted in mitigating the negative aspects of information technology revolution and in counteracting computer and other high technology crime. In these two initiatives, that is the American Russian Declaration as well as the Russian resolution submitted to the UN, Russia pushed for the implementation of a multilateral global governance concept that called for equal treatment of all states and the protection of all individual interests. Evidently, this concept of a multilateral digital world was due to the fact that the Russian Federation opposed the monopoly position of the US, that the US had occupied at least since the disappearance of the Soviet Union. But this finding points to more. Apparently, in the eyes of the Russian Federation, global governance, as it had been adopted by supranational organizations such as the UN, operated according to the same principles that had determined global modeling during the Cold War. The joint description of problems is not necessarily linked to the mechanisms of their joint solution. And this brings us back to a starting point. It is true, cybernetics and cybernetic control loop models had offered the opportunity to formulate global tasks as complex planning challenges. And they had also helped to network research groups with each other. But they, did little, but they did little to actually solve the problems in terms of content. This was shifted to the ideological field. And apparently, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the reorganization of the world after 1991 did not change this approach, at least from the Russian point of view. Non-simultaneity obviously has something to do with competition. It is the basis for the agonal moment in action in order to create simultaneity. In our case, and probably in many other cases as well, backwardness does not represent a simple structural problem. For the concept of sovereignty remains significant and it is justified politically or ideologically. Backwardness is therefore not a finding that results from divergent historical progressive forces but a political fighting word. Thus, in any sphere, normativity appears as a question of ideological integrity. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, dear Roland. That was brilliant. Very good. And we can see some signs of claps. Uh, absolutely. So, Please do use the chat function to pose your questions. And in the meantime, I have the privilege of asking a question of my own. Uh, I was especially uh, fascinated by this example of Glushkov's 
uh, development and uh, the uh, impetus that Glushkov gave to the development of the uh, new field, or by that time not really new, but still relatively new fields of cybernetics. And um, it is especially fascinated, fascinating in the context of this term, backwardness, uh, which, which you start your paper with and uh, which you end your paper with as well. So of course, it is so crucial. And in this context, um, I was thinking to myself, this example of Glushkov literally thinking about using this automization process to apply to the civilian purposes. And that as you, as you uh, really brilliantly put it in your paper, uh, that that was the first time it was it was done worldwide, and this idea of uh, applying this nascent science, as it were, to these societal processes, there was something quite uh, radically new. And at the same time, another thing that I really appreciated is this moment that you mentioned, where the cybernet cybernetics, even though it originated in the states, was in decline, but then because of this resumed. Uh, interest in the Soviet Union that pushed this, uh, the, uh, the, the US to actually develop that field again. And so the reason I'm bringing these two brilliant examples that you gave up is because that shows to us that indeed the question of backwardness might be quite problematic and not devoid of this ideological subtext, as you referred to, especially in your conclusion. And so I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit more on that, on how uh, this specific example of cybernetics in the context of the Cold War uh, can show to us that the Cold War and this competition, this tug of war between the United States and the Soviet Union was not just that of the backwardness as the Soviet Union always lagging behind, but rather as exactly that, this tug of war, this alternate change of pushes and influences between the two systems. Is that a valid way to look at it? Or is that um, simplifying it and distorting it in your view? Thank you very much, Bogdan. No, no, it's not distorting. It's not this, and 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 it is not simplifying the fact. I think, um, well, I think the fact in itself is very complicated because you know, I just simplified the notion of backwardness. You know, kind of you know have, uh, having a relation two kind of parties, the one is the forerunner and the other one is lagging behind or something like that. And it is, well, I think, I, I assume that most of the protagonists thought like that. Um, but what they found in cybernetics is, um, just beside all the other sciences, you know, like, like rocket building and blah, and, 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 and all these, uh, these, these atomic shifts they, 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 they experienced in the 50s and 60s, but in cybernetics, there was something, a kind of neutral field where we could act a bit more freely than we could in, um, than, than, in, than, than, uh, than in other fields. And um, I think that the enthusiasm on both sides, um, uh, well, helped all the protagonists, but they did not detract them from, well, I just showed you this, this, um, this quotation from uh, Gvishiani, um, from the idea that there is, in the end, no real kind of approximation and no, no, no real, you know, uh, um, um, coincidence of all things we have, be it a glo global environmental problem, be it a technological problem, be it the anticipation of catastrophes and so on, because uh, we could only claim in the end our normativity, and that is our supremacy in an, in an ideological way. It is not possible to do that in, on a technological basis. And that's what cybernetics showed to them. Um, I mean, in a way, it reinforced the ideological battle on a field which was without any ideological core, as most of the protagonists claimed. You know, in the, in the, in the 50s and 60s, they said, well, well, we could use all these formulas because they are not ideological. It could not be, it's mathematics just use it and just try to benefit from it. But in the end, it reinforced uh, the, uh, the positions, the ideological positions. That's, that's my view. That's what I kind of found out by looking on this topic. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, great, Alexander Verd would, would like to ask a question. Please, Alexander. Uh, 
Oh, am I already unmuted? Sorry for this. <laughs> so I found this totally fascinating. Uh, and I have a really much too complex question, but uh, perhaps uh, perhaps I'll try to, to pose it because I always found uh, uh, semiotics and Yuri Lotman so totally kubernetic. And uh, so I reflected for this for the last years, but never in this big context and of course I have no idea about computer science and mathematics and all of it but I found it really fascinating and by your last argument that this was a supremacy plant all the formulas not being ideological but as you said it's your counter thesis that that led totally to ideology I came to the point with this uh, with uh, Lotman school of semiotics start to Moscow school because perhaps it's really not so dissident as we always thought and I'm coming to this by when I read years ago uh, Eros Nevazmoznova from by Alexander Atkin where he totally destroyed uh, Mikhail Bakhtin and said this guy was not at all dialogic this guy was totally monologic like all the others and I never had a destruction like this like in this book from Alexander Etkin of Mikhail Bakhtin I thought uh, in principle that was so much common sense and uh, exactly this intention to be a planned state with rationality and just conquering a liberal chaos of United States and all this uh, uh, this chaos of, of all these economic forces that have no plan and that will fail, like today, I mean, this decadency by having a good plan and kubernetics and mathematics and all this and then rationality science. And if you look to, to this, I think then even the, the, this, uh, this Tartu school is, is not at all dissident, it's just mainstream. And I would not even see a dif difference to Marxism in principle. That's just coming back to what we discussed yesterday. That was totally interesting from yesterday. I really have had no idea about the Ukraine. I'm really sorry for this, about all these Ukraine guys. I always I thought always I'm totally specialist in Russian formalism and Prague structuralism. Even the Polish guys was, a little bit or not in garden but the others new for me but this was really fascinating yesterday but but now what if you look now what is and what is the the this yuri lotman semiotics this eastern semiotic style of to to roland bart and umberto echo in the west and the kubernetics in this the Kuber, because they are fascinating for me that was always a semiosphere um biosphere or even the term terms it's also mathematics kubernetics so and by your uh, by your thesis, I would come to the point that this also led into the same ideology than Marxism in principle. What you said now, or would I be wrong by interpreting your your talk like this, uh, Roland? If I got you correct, that is that all these euphoria and all what has been done about cybernetics. Um, in the end, ended up in being Marxist. Is it right? Is is that what you said? Oh <laughs> no, but I thought I, when when I listened to you, it is it is not dissident. It's not ah. a bit of Marxism. What we we see always, I always was taught like this in university. Not man school was dissident school. Only could be done in far okay. away from the center. But if we see cybernetics as you it interpreted. It's not so dizzy then it's just mainstream in your what you say in principle now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not so very deep in in uh, in uh, uh, in semiotics. Uh, well, I, I've I've read Lopman, but it's a long time ago when I was a, when I was a student. Um, um, <clears throat> um, I don't know if Lopman knew. All these things, what in the Tsemi and so on went on, and in, in the in, in 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 the mathematical institutes in the fifties and sixties, uh, 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 in the fifties and sixties in in Petersburg, in, in Leningrad and in Moscow, if he knew or in Kiev, if he knew, he would be Molodets, of course. But what I can say is that these, um, you know, if you want to have a link between, let's say, this economic planning or economic calculating and the outer world there is one uh, of which i know and that is football football um uh, dynamo kiev dynamo kiev and its famous famous manager my god 
um, the most famous manager. What's his name? Um, in the 70s, come on. Lobanovsky. Okay. Lobanovsky, Lobanovsky. Spasiba, Lobanovsky. Lobanovsky, Loba, Lobanovsky. He, well, he, uh, he contacted, um, there was a very, very um, important institute in Kiev, cybernetic institute. Um, um, and he contacted um, those guys um, and um, <clears throat> with those guys, with those computer guys, he created new training programs. And the result of these programs were that whole Europe was in absolute fear of Dynamo Kiev. Nobody, nobody of the big, big uh, uh, teams like Liverpool, like Leeds, like Roma, like Bayern Munich wanted to play against um, against um, Dynamo Kiev because they lost. And it's not because Dynamo Kiev was a brilliant Brazilian football team. No, the, 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 the stereotype was, uh, come on, let's see, see, look, look, look upon this Soviet team. It's kind of machine-like. There is no individualist in it. There's no kind of Maradona, kind of, okay, it's not Maradona, kind of Pele, kind of Beckenbauer, but Lobanovsky, on the other side said, no, 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 it's not about individualism, it's not about ideology, it's about there is a function in the team. And this function is defined by, by, uh, by, um, by um, some uh, characteristics and the player has to fulfill these characteristics and has to conduct, as I say, these characteristics has make him conduct. And that's what he put, how he tried in the 70s and still in the 80s, to play football in a cybernetic way, in a cybernetic way, by computer programs, by having having um, um, uh, um, the the experts from from the from the Kiev Institute um, take part in um, in his football team in the end, and maybe maybe a lot more. Just just to get back, maybe a lot more knew of all these things uh, in, uh, in 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 Moscow and uh, and 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 Leningrad. But I, but I don't think so. If he knew, it would be great. And if not, he would be one of those, as you said, uh, kind of, you know, a, not a big blockbuster, but a kind of that, kind of that. It, was, it wouldn't have been such dissident as most of them viewed upon it in the 70s and 80s from outwards. That's super cool. Can I add one? Could link this to Yuri Olesha Zavist, where there is the football player. And this uh, this non individualistic communist football play and the conflict with it that, that's totally fascinating. Uh, but is, I think even Yuri Olesha did not reflect Kubernetes as much. But I think Yuri Lotman did, I guess. But I'm not so expert in Yuri Lotman. But uh, thank you very much, Roland. Thank. You. Incredible. The only rhetorical question I can ask is where else would you hear this fantastic connection between football, cybernetics, and se semiotics? than at this wonderful History of Science U-Team conference. Uh, just music to your uh, scholars and intellectuals' ears, honestly. Fantastic. So we have a couple more questions, actually. So uh, if I may ask Dr. Uh, Chakrabarti, would you like to ask your question first? Oh, thank you. Just very briefly, um, I was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not that uh, I'm not aware of uh, Soviet the field of Soviet cybernetics, but I was wondering, listening to the paper, uh, because I had a conversation recently uh, with someone who had, who used a senior person who used to work for the Gosplan and the Gosnab. So in terms of uh, the Soviet exposure or the exposure of Soviet scientists and Soviet technocrats, especially to uh, what in those days was advanced computing, a lot of this uh, Soviet exposure was, as one reads, through the GDR, through the DDR. Is that correct? Was the main uh, Soviet exposure in terms of reverse engineering? So the Soviets were actively reverse engineering uh, computer prototypes that they came across in Germany, for example. And that was how the DDR was instrumental into channelizing computing technology, what in the 60s and 70s was advanced computing technology through the uh, technique of reverse engineering 
to the Soviet Union. Is that a correct uh, surmise? Was the Soviet as far as I know, you are correct. Yes, the GDR they had where well, all the computer, no, not all, but many of the computer devices they um, were kind of copied from IBM. They came from the US, and then from then started spreading exactly. throughout not the world but throughout the, the Eastern world, and uh, it was in the fifties, um, particularly in the sixties. Where the GDR, as far as I know, uh, started this industry kind of, you know, in secrecy um, to um, to buy some IBM computers and kind of, you know, put them just to break them and to put them together and to copy them um, and then to sell them in the GDR and uh, partly um, to the Soviet Union. Yes, you're right. That's that's my information as well. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Well, now then we are moving to our third speaker. And it's my great pleasure to present Dr. Sergei Zhuk, a former Soviet expert in US history, especially in the social and cultural history of colonial British America. So Zhuk moved in 1997 to the United States defended his new, now American, PhD dissertation about Imperial Russian history at Johns Hopkins University in 2002. Since 1997, he taught American colonial history, Russian slash Soviet and Ukrainian history at Ball State University, the University of Pennsylvania, Johns Hopkins University and Columbia University. His research interests are international relations, knowledge production, cultural consumption, religion, popular culture, and identity in a history of Imperial Russia, Ukraine, and the Soviet Union. Zhuk's scholarship was awarded with numerous research grants, including Cannon Institute to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Rockefeller Foundation, Bellagio Center in Italy, Fulbright, Mellon Foundation, and a few others. Just recently, he was invited as a Fulbright Scholar to teach in 2022 in Estonia. His recent publications include Soviet Americana, The Cultural History of Russian and Ukrainian Americanists, published in 2018. Another one, Nikolai uh, uh, Balha Balhavitinov and American Studies in the USSR, People's Diplomacy in the Cold War 2017, Rock and Roll in the Rocket City, the West Identity and Ideology in Soviet Dnipropetrovsk, 1960-1985, and, and a few others. Currently, he finished writing a book about the KGB operations against the USA and Canada in Soviet Ukraine in 1953-1991. The floor is yours, Dr. Zhuk, please. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. And um, although it was too early and <laughs> long pre talks uh, before my presentation, so I will try to be brief and short. Um, my uh, talk today is a uh, connection uh, of two projects. Um, so the Americana about uh, social and cultural history of Soviet Americanists in Russia and Ukraine, Soviet Russia and Soviet Ukraine and about um, uh, KGB operations against the United States and Canada in Soviet Ukraine. Uh, this research uh, based mostly on my recent found in, findings in um, SBO archives in 2019, I spent an entire year working there. And uh, good news I, I got from my editors, a book will be published this April, next April in London, New York. So it's, uh, uh, so I begin uh, with small correction about uh, originality of um, Soviet cybernetic research. Uh, according to archival documents, entire computer science in Kiev in Soviet Ukraine in the 60s uh, was based on a stolen material. So what Soviet um, engineers and Soviet um, scientists did who traveled to the United States and to Germany and other parts of the world, they stole technological, including cybernetic uh, secrets and brought them back to the, uh, to the Soviet Union. 
So in the 60s, 75% of all so-called innovations in cybernetic came from IBM and other firms uh, which invited Soviet specialists who just um, stole this information and the KGB used this information. It's just correction. We forgot about this um, very important role of KGB and GRU in collecting information, including technological information, using this like China uh, does right now. And but it's it's typical example of this exchange of ideas, exchange of technological secrets between um, Soviet bloc and um, America. I will talk about. Um, uh, one group of scholars who were politically engaged and uh, whose institutions, so we'll talk about most of it, uh, about institutions and role of individuals in these institutions, um, very different from, from previous uh, presenters. Uh, I will talk about um, so-called area studies uh, created in Cold War, in particular Soviet studies in uh, the West, Sovietology, Russian studies. Uh, I understood that many of uh, our colleagues here represent um, this field of knowledge, which was re related to this area studies in the Cold War. Um, the same in, in, in the United States, they had um, uh, these uh, departments of Slavic studies uh, Soviet studies, Russian studies, everywhere from Colombia, Stanford, and so on, uh, to study main enemy. Uh, the same happened in um, Soviet Union, but in Soviet Union, it happened later. Uh, if in the West, especially in the United States, at the beginning of Cold War, we have this very important and very strong push and direction of study everything in Soviet Union from economy to uh, literature, from Pushkin to ballet, from cybernetics to uh, mathematics in those days uh, to um, philology, uh, from history to archaeology. Uh, and it started very early and it was uh, based on a very important material um, funding from various corporations like rent corporations in Soviet unions it started late. Uh, the first center for um, for American studies as a field as an area study of Cold War in Soviet Union was created only in 1953 after the death of um, uh, Stalin. And um, from the early beginning, major goal of this center and the other centers which were created later in 67 uh, Institute of uh, the United States, later known as Arbatov Institute. Um, and then in 78, it was uh, Kiev Institute, uh, later known as uh, Shlipakov Institute. Mm, so three centers, only three centers, that's it. Uh, compare with numerous uh, centers of Slavic, uh, Russian, Ukrainian studies in mostly Russian. Uh, Ukraine was not um, accepted, unfortunately, in those days um, as part of um, this um, uh, focus, Slavic focus. Um, even in my Indiana, uh, state of Indiana, we have the best, one of the best in the world, Center for Slavic Studies in Bloomington, in Indiana University, the, the oldest one, which was funded by CIA, which was funded by the Department of State, again, um, but still, they had also funding from private institutions, from businesses, as early as 1946, compare this to Moscow Center in 1953. And um, um, again, in uh, American case, we have variety of actors, variety of uh, sponsors of these um, centers, not only intelligence centers, not only CIA, uh, not only military intelligence, but also uh, many intellectuals, um, various financial interests and so on. 
in Soviet Union, it was different from the early beginning. And I will try to show, share this um, screen with uh, you guys. Uh, uh, can you see, well, uh -huh. can you see this picture? What yeah, uh, this uh, famous figure uh, in Soviet academia and uh, in Soviet intelligence service. His name is Iosif Grigulevich, and he's founding father of Latin American studies. Paradoxically, in the Soviet Union, the first center of American studies combined three areas of so-called American interests. Of course, United States, uh, Canada, and Latin America. Actually, in uh, Soviet academic jargon, uh, Americanistica uh, later on was known, especially in the 60s, as an um, area of studying two capitalist advanced industrial nations, United States and Canada. Then America was separated in 68, actually. Um, center organized by this guy was uh, removed from, uh, from this uh, first center. But the, uh, this uh, man is, uh, was architect of American studies in Soviet Union. He was professional um, uh, intelligence officer, very intelligent, very uh, wise. Um, he uh, actually participated in operation of uh, um, Trotsky assassination, probably you know this story. And Grigulevich uh, created entire field of American studies. And from the early beginning, these people like Grigulevich control this knowledge or studies of main enemy of the Soviet Union. They knew many languages, they traveled, um, and they actually control selection of so-called cadre, uh, personnel for their centers. Um, later on, when he uh, moved to his own Institute of Latin America, um, he was replaced with another guy. Uh, can you see this? Uh, uh, share screen, yes. Yeah, can you see this picture? Yeah, perfect. Uh, and this uh, number, one actually, although he uh, succeeded um, Grigulievich as specialist in history of the United States and Canada, but he was instrumental for two other centers. He recommended a uh, party uh, uh, Funcionier uh, Arbatov to become center, center director for another institute called um, Institute of uh united states and then in, in, in 1975 um, uh, they added canada it was called institute institute sasha i canada um institute of the united states and canada from 1975 and sivasana was um instrumental figure in creating all the all these fields and many leaders of um, other centers including the ukraine center uh, Shlipakov and um, the group M of Americanists in MGU, led by N N Sivachov, controlled by this uh, gentleman. His name is uh, Grigory Sevastyanov, and he's a professional KGB officer, KGB uh, representative in uh, uh, Soviet academia. Uh, and uh, he tried to control those uh, people like my um, advisor, Bolchavidinov, who uh, tried to be more liberal, tried to be more westernized. And um, uh, Sevastyanov had very interesting experience. He worked for Smerz. He, in, during the war, he organized um, guerrilla, partisanska движение, guerrilla movement in Belarus. And in the 40s, he uh, organized this Chinese uh, resistance to Japanese imperialism in the Far East. So it's a very interesting figure. Uh, he is a heroic figure in KGB um, um, history. 
Sebastian of new uh, Japanese, Chinese languages, and uh, English language, of course. But it was his second specialization. But he was instrumental in transforming this center created by Gugulevich in 53 in purely uh, American studies center. Uh, I, uh, I circulated paper concerning mostly on Shlipakov figure, but I, I want to mention uh, the role of uh, these people in uh, the developing of um, American studies. They especially became very important uh, during, um, uh, during um, exchange area between Soviet and um, American intellectuals which started in 1958 uh, when uh, Soviet government and American government uh, signed a uh, special agreement about culture, academic exchanges. And of course, KGB became instrumental in this um, field as well. Um, many uh, Americans understood this. And if you look through CIA documents or even IREX documents um, and documents for other American organizations which uh, supervised exchange between uh, Soviet Union and the United States, you will find these negative description of these institutes. So Institute of World History where uh, Sevastyanov controlled new sector of uh, Sasha and Canada, United States and Canada uh, was called spy sector by um, uh, American academics. And Arbatov and, and another uh, employee of Sevastyanov in Moscow, who uh, created Institute of the United States and Canada in 1968, uh, his institute was called, of course, a spy institute. So, uh, and to some extent, um, uh, CIA experts were right. 80% um, of all um, uh, Soviet guests, all these visitors uh, represented um, intelligence service, either uh, KGB or GRU, Государственное разведное управление. So I, I will show you uh, from the early beginning how it, it worked. Uh, let's go to um, um, this picture as well. Uh, probably you know uh, this face, uh, especially people who live in the West, in, in the United States. Uh, this is former uh, General Kalugin. But people uh, forgot that uh, during the first exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union in 1958, uh, Soviet sent four students, so-called Americanists, uh, one of them was a uh, journalist, Americanist, uh, Kalugin. Uh, uh, another was Bekhtirev, um, who was expert in American law. This guy was expert in uh, American journalism. Um, uh, Stashkov uh, was specialist in um, uh, uh, American history during in the World War II. And the last one, number four, uh, also familiar name for many of you, Alexander Yakovlev, who was expert in uh, history of the uh, United States during World War II and so on. So if you analyze who are these three guys, except Alexander Yakovlev, they were um, official, actually, uh, representatives uh, for uh, Soviet KGB nomenclatura. Uh, this organization. So, so uh, Kalugin and Bekhtirev were uh, KGB officers, and Stashkov was a uh, uh, GRU officer. So, only Yakovlev, uh, technically speaking, was not related to KGB, although, of course, he uh, was cleared by KGB. And um, Soviet uh, practice uh, of um, uh, control and censorship. Um, in uh, exchange programs um, actually um, supported those people who uh, wanted to collaborate with KGB. Again, many uh, Soviet scholars 
did this because it was only one opportunity to go abroad and visit the United States and so on. But still, um, majority of people from the early beginning, from 1958, three from four were intelligence officers. Later on, this ratio changed uh, in uh, in 70s, and uh, according to uh, new quota, we had half and half. And I remember remarks of um, my two teachers by Nikolai Bolkhavichinov, Yaron uh, Gurevich, who told me, Sergei, we had two and two uh, uh, in our um, group coming to US. Uh, half of these guys, or half and half, half of these guys were um, KGB officers and half were uh, Soviet schools who uh, tried to collaborate with um, uh, this uh, service because they wanted archives, they wanted materials and so on. Um, so another uh, important figure in this list uh, was, um, and I will try to, uh, this guy, can you see? So yeah. sad that we can only see the least of the photos, but we can't see the photo in detail. Uh -huh. you, well, uh, now you see this? A near picture of Nikolai uh, Sivachov? Not yet. It's highlighted, we can see, but we can't, can't see the actual face very well. But at the same time, we can see the outline, so. Uh, well, let me see. Don't worry too much. Oh, what is, um, what is, let me see. I'll, I'll try to show this, um, mm, uh, but anyway, uh, I, um, screen tells, okay. It said that um, uh, it's uh, failed to, um, to share, but anyway. Uh, it's enough uh, pictures of these guys, but uh, um, uh, another very important figure was, um, and um, favorite of all Americans uh, was um, uh, Nikolai Sivachov, uh, another appointee of um, uh, Sivastyanov, who was one of the most talented young um, uh, scholars who sent in 61 uh 62 columbia to columbia university and he um uh, became the most important figure in modern um, um uh, american history in american historiography he wrote a book about uh, the new deal but at the same time he became um actually another very important figure in kgb um influencing um, young scholars and so on. Uh, according to archival documents, uh, Nikolai Sivachov uh, not only worked for KGB, but he also uh, was uh, in, uh, in this group of so-called um, advisors for KGB uh, programs, uh, which control this exchange um, uh, exchange uh, politics between the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, Sivachov became an uh, instrumental figure, especially after 1968, when IREX and other American programs for exchange became active. Fulbright came to um, uh, Soviet Union, and Fulbright program became controlled in the 70s by Gorbachev in in um, uh, United States. And it's paradox that uh, Sivachov was the most favorite uh, figure um, among um, uh, his American colleagues because of his uh, perfect English, uh, his knowledge of American culture, American history, but he was the most conservative, the very Stalinist professor back in Moscow State University. Many of students, including myself, who knew him personally, were shocked how cautious, how anti-American he was in this uh, period of 
uh, his teaching in America, in, 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 in Moscow, in Moscow State University. Another consultant who was uh, created by KGB for this exchange program came from uh, Kiev, and it was um, uh, Shlipakov. Unfortunately, my system doesn't work. I can't show his uh, picture, um, but I'll try uh, if I, um, it should be, I don't know why it's not allowing me to show my pictures. Um, uh, but anyway. No, I, I will not waste time on, on uh, looking uh, what happened with my technology. I'm not great with my technology. And again, I'm back to uh, in, in personal classes in, in Indiana. We have no Zoom anymore. Uh, so uh, I'm teaching uh, in class all the time. Anyway, um, uh, uh, these consults became very important uh, during um, another period of intensification of this exchange program. In the history of academic exchange in Soviet Union, we have three major stages of the exchanges. One is was connected to Khrushchev Thor, and uh, it started in 58-59. And uh, after um, a scandal with U2 uh, uh, plane in um, uh, in 1960, it, everything changed. Uh, Soviets planned um, a special uh, visit of Dwight Eisenhower, American uh, American um, uh, president to Soviet Union. But because of uh, this new Spionamania in the early 60s, all these programs were frozen again. Um, and uh, they renewed after Khrushchev under Brezhnev and during Daytona, especially in the 70s, we have peak of these exchanges. And during these exchanges, uh, KGB played again a very important role in American studies and uh, controlling Americans uh, going abroad. And uh, two uh, major figures in Moscow and Kiev became important for this exchange. One was uh, uh, Sivachov in Moscow. I wrote about this in my book, um, Soviet Americana. And another was Shlipakov uh, from uh, Kiev. So uh, during this period of time, um, uh, according to my archival research, uh, KGB oriented all these Americanists um, uh, for two things. First, to establish relations uh, with um, American audience, especially with the representatives of so-called Slavic studies. So if you analyze uh, behavior of Americanists in the United States, you will see that they became very active in establishing connections with Sovietologists, with specialists in Russian and Slavic studies over there, and uh, it, it's understandable because these people uh, knew Russian, uh, Ukrainian, or uh, whatever Slavic languages they are represented. And um, uh, this was one major uh, role, establishing these relations. And uh, uh, major goal was to promote Soviet interests among this community of uh, Soviet scholars or Sovietologists in American academia. And this tradition still exists. And um, uh, in FSB um, uh, instructions, they still um, try to use uh, scholars uh, in this field in the United States to uh, promote Russian interests, to forget about Ukraine, for example, um, to emphasize the role of Russia and so on. And uh, this old tradition in KGB reports and KGB uh, analysis of early 70s, I found very interesting instructions how to influence um, uh, these pro-Soviet in those days, now it's pro-Russian interests, to promise uh, uh, good reception of these American guests in Kyiv and Moscow and Leningrad, uh, promise them better accommodations, 
uh, access to archives and library materials. So it was a kind of KGB operation uh, in promoting these Soviet interests in uh, this academia, promising all these perks, all these privileges for many of these people. And these scholars eventually who collaborated with uh, Soviet Americans, with Soviet guests, eventually uh, received very good treatment in Leningrad, in um, Moscow, in Kiev, and so on. And the second uh, goal of these exchange programs controlled by KGB for Soviet Americans. So the first was promote uh, Soviet interests among this um, uh, group of uh, American scholars, Sovietologists, uh, Slavs, and so on. The second goal was to collect information, not only um, humanitarian political information, but also to um, find some um, channels of technological information. And the uh, paradox is that uh, many of these uh, Soviet scholars were either historians by training or, or sociologists. Sociology did exist in Soviet Union in Marxist form, but it did exist. And Slapin talk, uh, you know, wrote about this. Uh, but anyway, uh, so uh, many of these Soviet uh, Americans were not um, uh, engineers or physicists, not scientists by training. So, um, uh, for example, uh, as called uh, uh, Arnold, excuse me, Shlipakov, who uh, provided his reports, um, uh, made a lot of mistakes, uh, technical mistakes, when he described some kind of um, uh, technological innovation he in encountered in New York. And he actually represent uh, Ukraine in um, uh, United Nations um, organization in, in uh, 1971-73. So, um, and as a result of this, uh, KGB tried to promote uh, visits to United States um, of engineers who were present as Americanists. The most uh, important channels for this exchange were two institutions, Arbatov Institu Institution, which was created by, um, actually by Sevastyanov, by uh, under KGB uh, control, and the second was um, uh, Shlipakov Institute in um, in Kiev. And uh, uh, what KGB did, they uh, promote career of engineers, specialists in uh, cyber technology, in uh, mathematics, physicists. And as a result, if you will see IREX documents, uh, they are available in uh, Library of Congress to everybody. Uh, you'll be shocked. 80% um, of all so-called Soviet Americans from 72 to 79, uh, from Arbatov and uh, Shlipakov um, in, in 79, uh, were not humanitarian, not scholars. They were either uh, engineers, uh, technicians, um, scientists, physicists, and so on. So it was uh, another very important uh, uh, mission of um, this um, uh, exchange program, which existed from '58 uh, uh, and which was represented by IRICS, by uh, um, American Council of Societies, by Fulbright and other American organizations, and by Academy of Science from uh, Soviet Union as well. So num number three. Number three uh, goal for this exchange was to influence in American politicians, especially uh, representatives of um, American um, uh, left, American Canadian left. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, my um, Screen will, will allow me to show this. Can you see this picture? Uh, yeah, more or less. If you keep it like that, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. This guy is uh, 
Петро, о, Пітер, Кравчук, Ukrainian Canadian communist, who since, uh, actually at the beginning he was very, very loyal Stalinist, who from uh, late 40s was a guest of uh, Soviet Ukraine, who was supported by Soviet uh, administration, uh, whose uh, daughter uh, graduated from Kyiv State University in the 60s, who published many books in Ukrainian, in Soviet Kyiv, who um, had different interviews on radio and television, uh, so I don't know if Andriy remember this. He was always on television in sixties and seventies talking about Canadian farmers, Canadian Ukrainian communities, and so on. And he published many articles in Sesvit in um, uh, other uh, venues. But he was very important tool for KGB and Soviet influences. Uh, Canadian. And American communists were used to uh, this brainwashing campaign from Soviet embassies. Every month, and uh, you can find this in information in uh, KGB archives in Kyiv, every month, um, uh, Soviet embassy in Ottawa, in Canada, and Soviet embassy in uh, Washington, D.C., in the United States, uh, invited all progressives, all progressive representatives of Canadian and American public for briefing. And what happened during these briefings, uh, and this guy uh, Kravchuk uh, visited them almost every uh, month, um, Soviets instructed what to do, how to present events in Soviet Union, how to present story of so-called Soviet dissidents, or they either Ukrainian nationalists, Benderovites, you know, fascists, or Jewish Zionists, all of them fascists. So the major trope, and I wrote about this in my uh, new book about KGB operations, was fascism. So all these guys were fascists, uh, uh, Jewish fascists, Zionists, Look what they do uh, to what they did to Arabs, um, Ukrainian nationals, all of them fascists. Even these, uh, you know, communist uh, nationals were fascists because they were um, uh, against uh, brotherhood of all Soviet and so on. And during all these um, uh, briefings, uh, Soviets tried to influence uh, uh, this opinion. So. Soviet Americans who visited Canada, because they were also Soviet Americans, and the United States played also a very important role to connect to these leftist figures like Kravchuk, the message from KGB, how to present, how to inform local public uh, about events in Soviet Union. Moreover, Soviet Union provided uh, leftist uh, uh, pro Soviet journalists in um, Canada and Ukraine using Shlipakov and other Americans from Ukraine and from uh, Moscow. Um, they tried to provide uh, the local public with documentary materials, with um, documents which uh, criticized. Ukrainian nationalists as collaborators with fascists. Uh, they uh, actually helped to create certain films uh, about fascist Nazi atrocities in uh, Ukraine. And uh, the, they uh, uh, used Shlipakov and other uh, Soviet guests to promote these films. In 77, 79, uh, such films and the fascist films were shown all over the United States and um, Canada. Moreover, because uh, these films were about atrocities against Jewish people as well, so Soviet Americans approached a Jewish community in the United States, in Canada, and in Israel, and engaged this in their anti uh, this fascist campaign 
criticizing all so-called enemies of the Soviet Union from Ukrainian diaspora living in the United States and in Canada. Uh, again, I have this film uh, uh, in my collection, but I'm not sure that my, my Apple will, will allow me to show this. But anyway, um, I, I can email you this uh, link of the film. And uh, you will see. this film was shown on CBS, uh, on Canadian television in 77, 79. And actually it's prepared special actions uh, promoted by KGB in Canada and USA open trials of Nazi collaborators and fascists who committed trial crimes against humanities in Soviet Ukraine in those days. So uh, it was also part of this. So the first, uh, again, the first mission was to influence a uh, community of scholars, uh, specialists in Slavic studies, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and so on, uh, Sovietologists. The second was to collect, to steal information and uh, bring this information, uh, especially technological information. Uh, and number three, influence politics. I call this meddling in uh, domestic politics. We forgot when we talk about uh, this attempt of Putin to meddle in American relations, American uh, elections, in German elections, by the way. Uh, we forgot that uh, this, it's not purely Putin invention. This tradition existed. And um, uh, uh, the most important operation um, of Soviet KGB uh, in uh, this meddling in the, the domestic politics happened in 60s, in 68, 69, when uh, Soviets uh, hated uh, Nixon as candidate for Republican Party. And they promoted um, uh, Humphrey, um, uh, representative of the uh, Democratic Party. They invited him to Kiev. He visited to Kiev, and um, uh, he uh, met with Shlipakov and other Americanists from uh, um, uh, Ukrainian Academy of Sciences in um, uh, '68. Uh, they uh, tried to promote any uh, career of uh, Humphrey colleagues from Democratic Party colleagues, and um, uh, they uh, invited them uh, to various resorts in Crimea. Um, they uh, uh, tried to um, organize uh, uh, this um, uh, leisure time for these um, representatives of Democratic Party. It, it was a real operation. And even uh, uh, Soviet um, ambassador uh, Dabrinin mentioned uh, how uh, Soviets tried to influence the uh, Democratic Party. But I emphasize in my research, not just the uh, role of Dabrinin and diplomats, but role of um, Soviet Americans who invited Humphrey to uh, Arbatov Institute in uh, Moscow and who met uh, and they organized this meeting uh, of Humphrey with, um, uh, with uh, uh, Shlipakov in Kiev as well. So this was very important uh, part of uh, KGB operation influencing American and Canadian uh, politics. Uh, and uh, and uh, Soviet Americanists played a very important role. Uh, probably I have no time for, for uh, my presentation. So uh, to finish my presentation, uh, we uh, sometimes forgot that uh, cultural Cold War, uh, diplomatic Cold War, uh, political Cold War, economic Cold War also had another very important dimension, intelligence Cold War. And through intelligence, uh, uh, different actors try to influence their opponents, build bridges, and so on. 
And um, in my book, uh, I describe not only confrontation, confrontation be between CIA and uh, KGB, but also case of collaboration, Kiev, for example, because Kiev uh, was planned for two official meetings of American president Eisenhower. It was canceled later on. And Nixon, Nixon came. And both KGB and CIA collaborated protecting both Nixon and Brezhnev, for example, in Kyiv in 1972. And it was a very important element of, and they invited, of course, uh, specialists in American history, like Shlipakov and other Lyshchenko and other representatives of uh, Soviet uh, Ukrainian academia, who helped them to understand each other. So um, this exchange politics, this confrontation of intelligence services at the same time was attempt to build bridges and to understand each other. For example, both KGB and CIA in Kyiv sometimes exchange information about, uh, for example, uh, Zionist demonstration in uh, downtown Kyiv, which tried to, uh, to interrupt um, Nixon procession and so on. Um, they, uh, for example, Americans provided KGB officers with names of those people who were dangerous um, uh, members of uh, Arab communities, uh, community who tried to organize terrorist acts. And Shibikov and other uh, these uh, Ukrainian Americans played role consultants in this kind of uh, negotiation. So, um, uh, intelligence. Uh, history and its history of intelligence also provide us with another side of um, Cold War. Uh, through prism of these KGB and CIA documents, we can see how uh, intellectuals uh, and politicians try to understand each other, to establish relations and prevent military conflict, wars, and so on. And they succeeded, actually. Uh, and with all our criticism of this collaboration between um, scientists and scholars and intelligence services, we need to understand that in this situation of confrontation, it was very important to keep these secret connections and maintain peace. Unfortunately, today we lost this. Look at uh, Russia-American uh, relations. Uh, Putin took very, very uh, different um, position. It's very different from Cold War position because even during Cold War, we had this secret uh, connection between intelligence of Soviet Union, and United States, and Khrushchev and um, Eisenhower could collaborate using these uh, connections. Nixon and Brezhnev uh, could collaborate uh, using this. But look what happened now. We uh, live in a very different uh, world, but we need to remember that historical tradition of this kind of collaboration still is a reminder for us, possibility of revisioning our diplomatic history and change this. Otherwise, we face actually military, economic, and now epidemic catastrophe. Thank you. Sorry for this. Sorry for my technology. Unfortunately, I could not show you. What my, a talk. It was page. a great chance for us to see more of you, Sergio. Wow, what a talk. What a talk. It's almost like watching a film about spies. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you so much. Really great. It was uh, such a fantastic reverse side uh, overview because um, and our, on the first day of the conference, we also had a, a great talk by Alexandra Romchuk about the role of exchanges and about the establishment of Soviet studies and Russian studies in the United States. And it was so valuable and uh, great to hear from you about the other side of this story. Absolutely incredible. And to hear, of course, about the role of the KGB and CIA and about intelligence. Uh, fantastic. I'm sure that I'm just expressing the general enthusiasm about it. Uh, so uh, I could only invite uh, uh, everyone to uh, post your questions in the chat box. And I'm very 
uh, lucky to have a moment before other people have done so to ask my question or well, a couple of my questions. Actually, I've got a few, but I'm going to try and be concise. Um, so in, in the first place, it was really uh, great to, to see um, uh, in your pre-circulated paper, Sergio, this uh, mention of um, Vitaly Korotic. Uh, he was a really interesting figure. He, because I'm still trying to figure out for myself. Vitaly Korotic was uh, essentially one of the uh, uh, poets uh, from the uh, generation of the 60s. But at the same time, it's a bit difficult to count him as, as that because uh, at the same time he was, uh, there was a bit more collaboration between him and the, and, the, and the Soviet regime as it were, than between other, she's the Satniki and the Soviet regime. But at the same time, in your pre-circulated paper, you showed so um, insightfully how it's, it's not so black and white, it's really complex. And, you know, for example, when I was reading memoirs by Raisa Moroz, the, the wife of uh, Valentin Moroz, one of the most yeah. radical, actually, dissidents yeah. in the whole of the Soviet Union, not just in Soviet Ukraine, that she was describing this uh, situation where Korotic, uh, even though he was friends with Ivan Svetlichny, pretty much the heart of the Ukrainian, she's the Satnik in Ukrainian dissidents. When Svetlichny came back from uh, exile, uh, one day we were on the bus, Korotic didn't even say hello to, to Svetlichny because he felt uh, so much of the shame that he, 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 he didn't follow the path that Svetlichny and Stus and Moroz did. But at the same time, in this pre-circulated paper, you also spoke about how uh, Korotic was also instrumentalized by uh, the uh, uh, KGB, but at the same time, later on, he was uh, uh, dismissed from his dip diplomacy Positions and uh, he wasn't welcome in, in all these diplomatic careers uh, because uh, he was considered to be too nationalist. So it, it's, it, to me, it was just a reminder of how nowadays it's so easy for us to go into this easy, simplified, narrow-minded, black and white divisions. But back in the day, it wasn't as as simple and as obvious. So perhaps if you could uh, elaborate uh, on that, that, that would be extremely interesting. Uh, but that was just more of a comment. And the two questions I had, uh, which uh, actually I had some other questions to you, but I now uh, it was great to, to hear some new thoughts as well uh, compared to the pre-circulated paper. I was wondering, uh, did the CIA uh, officers or CIA more generally know much about uh, this is a bit of a digression, perhaps, but still, uh, perhaps you might comment on that. A lot about the dissident movement in the Soviet Union and in particular in Soviet Ukraine. And were there any attempts to support that movement? And to what extent were they informed about it? So that's sort of a bit of the other side of the situation. And the final question that I cannot but ask, you mentioned that there is still this uh, continuity of uh, uh, the uh, intelligence services involvement in things academic and political uh, and nowadays uh, FSB performs the same role as KGB did and I was just wondering whether you could just share some more insights with us about FSB's modern day contemporary involvement in things academic if, if it's not too much of a mystery of course because that sounds extremely intriguing. Uh, I will start with uh, uh, with on this, uh, with the last question. Yes, it's it's uh, it's very important question, and uh, you need to understand that uh, uh, many uh, Russian uh, experts who now live in the United States and teach so-called Russian political studies, Russian government, uh, still connected to Russia and live in Russia. Uh, and uh, cut relations with the state of Russia is impossible. Um, I will not give you names, but uh, one famous professor of political science from San Francisco, he's Russian, his son of KGB officer. Um, many of guys who went to Georgetown, now he uh, moved out, but uh, they also... Uh, Fidition, well, I, I stop uh, giving names. Um, all these, my young colleagues who, whom I helped to 
defended the station in Washington DC and so on. Um, I realized later that they were, uh, again, you can go to Google, it's not like secret. Uh, they represent uh, this KGB elites. In Soviet times, probably people who are not familiar with this, but majority of people who were allowed to travel in 80s uh, still had some connection to Soviet elites. Uh, and to to um, KGB uh, and um, uh, grew whatever. So uh, people in the West forget about this. In America, if you go to Soviet Union uh, for research, you have no connections uh, to uh, CIA. Oh, you have connections, but it, it, again, it's it's not very important. You, uh, but in um, uh, Russian tradition and Ukraine tra tradition, unfortunately, it still um, exists. Not in Ukraine now, but it exists. Uh, the last time uh, my KGB supervisor and deep cross investor asked me to do this was in the 90s, after collateral Soviet Union. Can you imagine? And I had uh, to write some bullshit, excuse me for my language, some uh, fantasy about it. But anyway, uh, so it never uh, disappeared. But now Russia used different uh, channel, different tool, money. Soviet Union, as it turns out, was the richest, the wealthiest country of the world. And when Soviet Union collapsed, all this money now in the hands of few. And these few, like Putin and his comrades, use this for their own purposes. Uh, if you know uh, all these um, funding uh, in Cambridge, in Oxford, in Woodrow Wilson Center, Canon Institute, you'll be shocked how many uh, of these fundings came from Russian oligarchs. And, uh, or Ukraine, for example, Firtash include, uh, invest money in Cambridge and so on. All these guys are thieves, uh, but they're not just simple thieves, uh, not just simple criminals. They are oligarchs who ruled for Soviet space. And many of them, uh, especially in Russian Federation where KGB capitalism control everything, they depend on uh, Putin. And uh, well, I, I'm, uh, you know, I got a lot of uh, fellowships from Canon Institute of Woodrow Wilson Center. Before 2003, we had no Russian money involved in Wilson Center. Now, more and more oligarchs gave donations, money. Again, uh, nobody uh, built this direct connection between Putin and Russian oligarchs' money. Uh, but if you analyze how much they influence Slavic studies in the West, especially in the United States, I don't know about Canada, but in the United States, especially in Wilson Center, um, we have actually uh, different funds in American Slavic associations, which related to purely pro-Russian position. For example, like Cohen Fund for uh, graduate students. And Cohen actually represent very pro-Putin, pro-Russian version of history. And um, he criticized Ukraine, criticized Ukrainian oligarchs, so on. So we have this involvement of Russian influence through oligarchic money, post-Soviet money everywhere, everywhere. And not only in politics, um, both Russian and uh, American oligarchs, as you know, and it's official, uh, invested money in both Trump and Hillary. Um, but it's politics. What, what is worse, they, they invest money in scholarship. And this is bad. Look at how uh, structured our American association. I, I actually rejected the uh, visit association this time because it's still very pro-Russian, very pro-Putin. And many of these guys who are children of KGB generals and colonels still are very important 
instrumental figures in our association. You know, I'm not very political, I'm not national, <laughs> but you know, I want to be fair and uh, answering your last question, yes, you're right. Russian money now influence pro-Russian uh, focus in Slavic studies, in the United States at least. And I'm sure the same in Germany, I'm sure. But because Fir if Firtash gave money to Cambridge, so I don't know, I don't know how uh, you, uh, German academia built and uh, what kind of money they use, but in America, it's more capitalist um, based. We have a lot of uh, Russian um, uh, money. And the, 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 this official, you can go to, on, on the website of Wilson Center and you will see all these Russian names, donors. It's money. Money is power. It's influence. Uh, uh, next question about CIA. Yes, um, uh, and you need to understand, CIA helped dissidents, helped Ukrainian patriots. Um, they uh, provided money. Actually, at the beginning, entire um, uh, spy operations of um, uh, CIA in Germany, by the way, in your country, um, uh, was uh, built on community of Ukrainian, uh, of uh, American Ukrainians or German Ukrainians and so on. And special spy centers like Astra uh, and others, uh, many of them were created near Munich uh, movement and um, other centers, um, hundreds of them, by the way. I, 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 I devote an entire chapter to these American centers where they prepared uh, American spies on German territory, Western Germany, of course, um, against uh, Soviet Union, against Soviet Ukraine. Majority of uh, these peoples, these people came either from UNAUN, so, uh, UNAUN yeah, Ukraine National Organization and UPA, Ukraine, uh, rebel army, or from Roa, Rosh, Russian Liberated Army, Vlasovsky. Um, an actual good friend of me, Tromley, wrote about Vlasovsky, a wonderful book about CIA and Russian refugees in Germany, by the way. So yes, they used as, as early as 46, when uh, Cold War started, uh, CIA funded all these operations, and hundreds of them, thousands of them, went to Soviet bloc as spies, as um, uh, agents of CIA and so on. And in the 60s and 70s, despite of all the relaxations of tension, uh, despite of Dayton, Soviets, uh, excuse me, um, uh, American intelligence used various groups, uh, Jewish groups, uh, Ukrainian groups, Estonian groups, all these groups against uh, Soviet Union. The same Soviet Union used the same groups against uh, United States as well. So it was, um, Cold War of Intelligence, War of um, CIA and KGB. And um, finishing uh, with your last, first question about Karotic. Um, you know, I, um, I wrote my book about Dnipropetrovsk because I was tired about this black and white description of Soviet realities in uh, uh, American academia when I came to the United States. They could not understand what happened in real life. Uh, we have no black and white. You know, that's why I, I uh, supported uh, Alexei Yurchak book because, again, it's anthropological research, but still it was a very good attempt to analyze our life, not from position us and them, no, but uh, uh, try to understand complexity of living in closed Soviet society. Plus, I hated Moscow, I hated Leningrad, and that's why <laughs> I try to show that people, I'm, I'm provincial, I'm living in provincial town in Indiana now. I love province, you know, uh, province give you more time for reading, thinking, listening to music, and, uh, uh, and anyway, I'm Melman, I love everything from Bach to Beatles, from uh, you too to Beethoven, but anyway. Um, uh, and um, that's why uh, it's, uh, it was very important for me to show this trajectory uh, of Karotic. I had two chapters about Karotic. In this paper, I just showed this 
attempt of his collaboration with KGB and failure because he became too friendly with uh, Kravchuk. I remember a picture of this um, uh, great guy. Um, so um, uh, my uh, response to your comment that uh, we need to be very careful with um, criticizing people who collaborated with KGB. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a friend, uh, Lid Lyeshenko, a uh, great, uh, you know, Ukrainian historian of China and America, Soviet Americanist, who uh, tried to explain that without this collaboration, you could not make, it's not, it was not possible to make a career in Soviet academia, especially if you need to go abroad. Um, even uh, in case of dissidents, it was very difficult to survive being honest patriot. Many of uh, these honest patriots had families and uh, like Karotic, and they stopped being patriots, you know, and we can blame them for betrayal. But again, if you have family, if you need to survive, what can you do? So um, despite my critical turn of this book, I still, even, even um, you know, in, in previous, a great, I love uh, especially this presentation about the Glushkov Institute. Many people, including Glushkov, collaborated with KGB. They found uh, papers on Glushkov, uh, Glushkov reports on his own colleagues. But again, how these guys could survive in this terrible situation. It's the same like with Nazi Germany. It's very difficult for us to understand how people survived, how they kept their mouths shut. The same was Stalinist, Khrushchev's uh, Soviet Union, the same with even Brezhnev period, with all this democratization, still it was closed, controlled society. It's very difficult for us, especially people in the West who lived in open society to understand this. That's why I, I uh, wrote these three books, Rock and Roll Rock and City, Soviet Americana, and KGB Operations, because these people were heroes. Um, for example, well, I, I give you a story of my mom. My mom was a librarian who criticized uh, KGB, and her career was over. So, you know, it's it's very uh, difficult to talk about honesty, decency, and brave behavior living in comfortable West, but very difficult. Uh, for people like my mom and other people to survive this pressure living in that kind of society. Sorry, uh, I, I finished. It's too much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhuk. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yeah, I can see that we uh, have a comment straight away from Dr. Chakrabarti. Gautam, please. Thank you so much, Bokhtan, uh, uh, if I may. Uh, I just uh, listened to this fascinating paper and I don't really have a question or a comment, but I just wanted to briefly mention in continuation to what Professor Zhuk just said, Graham Greene, as the famous British novelist once wrote, it's easy to be in a conflict situation. I love this phrase. I remember this phrase. Yeah, it's a wonderful phrase. phrase. Yeah, yeah. Take judgmental positions. If you know there's a comfortable drawing room waiting for you in Chelsea, London, yeah, yeah, and a yeah. warm cup of tea. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So I, 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 it's one comment to Graham Greene. Again, he worked for intelligence, for British intelligence. Uh, but um, uh, frankly speaking, uh, when I began um, uh, visiting, when I began living in uh, Baltimore, uh, my best period was in airport, in Bristol airport, when I anticipated this you know, after cold Dnipro, with snowy Dnipro, with freezing, you know, I, I anticipated that I am back to my comfortable living in Baltimore, reading my books, listening to my Deep Purple music again. Well, I could do this in the Deep Purple, but still, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very good comment. Thank you very much. I love it. Yeah. Fantastic. So we now have uh, just under 15 minutes uh, before the end of our panel. And uh, I would just really invite um, our audience to pose questions to our speakers and, of course, uh, to you, uh, 
uh, to uh, Roland as well and to Adela. If I'm sure that you had some more questions as we were going along. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yes, Gautam, please. Um, this is a general question which comes out, of course, from the proceedings of this uh, extremely interesting conference. And I especially like the way the, the organizers have spaced out the papers and the panels and have clear foci in terms of the three different panels. So it has been a learning experience without crowding the mind a lot. And this, I really thank Professor Portnov Andri and the other organizers for this, uh, you know, very, for me, I'm not saying this because you guys are home, but this has been a very, very enriching learning experience. I've, I'm retaining a lot. That's what I wanted to say. And I think it's thanks to how you've organized it. Just uh, one of the things that strikes me in the discussions today and in, on the day before, uh, on the day before yesterday, uh, is throughout Eastern, and we just had a brief conversation uh, also about this, throughout Eastern Europe, and it comes from the number of Baltic Studies conferences I have attended uh, in the last decade in uh, Stockholm, in Estonia, in Tallinn, in, and also once in the US, uh, in Pittsburgh. So uh, one, of the th the, one of the things I feel about the organization of post-socialist, post-Soviet knowledges or epistemologies in throughout Eastern Europe, especially in places like the Baltics or in some parts of East Central, Euro uh, East Central Europe or Central Europe, is that in people's enthusiasm for what many scholars see as quote unquote Western modernity or the Westernization drive or the Westernization imperative, uh, a lot of previous epistemological methodologies or theoretical paradigms or previous work was jettisoned. And sometimes, in, for example, in, in the public discourse in Estonia, in the post-socialist years in the 90s in terms of how uh, the exploits of the Estonian Waffen-SS battalions was, were memorialized. And in Latvia, the discourse about the Shoah and Latvian complicity with the Shoah, these various complicated issues. It seems that throughout Western Europe, there was, as an Estonian uh, folklorist told me like 10 years ago when I went for a conference in Tartu, that the moment the Soviet Union fell, we bought all the books we could buy on French theory and removed all the Soviet books from our shelves and filled them up with French theory. Now, my question to all the panelists would be, and if anyone else, any expert, any other expert would be, I know this is an August Slavist audience, so the best people to answer this question. Uh, do you think that this enthusiasm for quote unquote Western European, I mean, let's just use the right word for it, French theory or actually French theory. I mean, the shelves and the conference papers one saw in Baltic studies conferences, which had to do with Foucault, Lacan, especially Lacan. Is this just about, is this just a yearning for modernism or postmodern theory as understood in a post-socialist space? Or is there also a political baggage to it? Is the yearning for French theory, is the yearning for Lacan also about rejecting the Soviet Union and the Russophone episteme. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear Gautam. Just to say before you guys have a chance to uh, comment on that and give your replies that we have around 10 minutes or so, just under 10 minutes uh, before we break, before we close and talk. So uh, Gautam's question is absolutely brilliant and I'm sure that we could organize a whole conference on that. <laughs> On that question alone, uh, but thank you so much for it. And if uh, if there are some uh, brief comments, uh, please please do you share your thoughts with us. I have just one comment, uh, brief comment. Um, in Russian speaking, Ukrainian speaking world in Soviet Union. Uh, Majority of our people, again, uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, Edkin's um, works. Uh, so you can find this 
uh, in his book as well. My co-citizens uh, try to find alternative to their theoretical baggage of uh, traditional Marxism in the West, even in form of neo-Marxism, because when we talk about Foucault, we forgot that Foucault was connected to Marxist uh, influence as well. Um, so um, I don't know how people in the West lived in the 70s and 80s, but um, people in Soviet Union were westernized enough and they love all these Western theories. So we, when we came back to the West, we found it's not sometimes uh, fit what our images were in the Soviet Union. Uh, as a result, for many Soviets, including my friend Edkin, we have this frustration with the realities of life in the West, comparing to Foucault-Lacan theory, which we read um, in the 80s in the Soviet Union. So. Uh, and Andrew, uh, I know uh, that, that you mentioned earlier that you also had a comment. Um, I just remembered. Uh, Do you mind sharing a couple of words as well? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, dear Bogdan. I'm feeling a bit, uh, how to put it, uh, yeah, it's unfortunately the end of this panel, so uh, I am sorry like, for uh, keeping vote for myself. What is my observation, dear colleagues? You know, like I've been thinking about all three uh, presentations we've had, and I have kind of an observation that is, again, maybe makes no real sense, maybe still. So please decide it for you and we will continue with the keynote final lecture by Nikolai Koposov, who already joined us. So I have an impression that in all three papers, we have kind of like a story or reflection on the at different attempts, uh, very much caused by ideological concerns, of course, but still attempts to, uh, how to put it, let's say to bring technology or mathematics a bit closer to what we used to call humanities nowadays. It was not called humanities in, in Soviet times, but uh, now we call it like that. Because you see like uh, the socialist sociology, it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's very much about some, yeah, like reliable, you know, like technological, let's say data, yeah, to be used for analyzing something, if you wish to, yeah. Uh, in case of cybernetics, it's clear and we'll have this, like incredible football example, like how it works <laughs> in real life, not just on theoretical level. And, you know, uh, listening to uh, Sergei, I like reminded myself for some reason all the time that like both of us graduated from this special university, Dnipropetrovsk University in a big closed Soviet city. And this university, dear colleagues, among other things, was one of the centers, Soviet centers, if you wish, of so-called uh, application of mathematical methods to historical research. Um, Think about it. <laughs> how could we use like, yes. <laughs> exactly? Yeah. How could we use like mathematics to do history better? Of course, the real center was in Moscow, academician Kovalchenko, and so on. But again, like local, but at the same time special, closed. Dnipropetrovsk was like a yeah, kind of like a field to exercise this one. And actually, I don't know, maybe there is something in it because nowadays I feel that uh, we, I mean, like me as a historian, so to say, it's rather like far away from, you know, cybernetics, mathematics, <laughs> even sociology, dear colleagues, even sociology. But it was not like that in 1970s, 1980s. Maybe I'm wrong here. It's just kind of an observation uh, to think about. And what I also like to say that I think especially Adela's talk gives us this feeling that how productive this intensive comparison of uh, doing uh, social science and humanities in different parts of so-called socialist world or was so packed or like name it, yeah, socialist uh, camp, <laughs> yeah, how productive it could be, because on the one hand, it was still kind of the same, in a way, but on the other hand, it was very much not the same, and then like the next step would be to think that also inside the Soviet Union, it was not the same, and actually, I'm very grateful for Sergei to point out that there were like 
you know, like American studies also on the periphery, so to say. And it was not exactly the same as in Moscow. So I think that like keeping this entire complexity in mind is exactly what non-simultaneity is about. Thank you very much. Amen. With this, uh, I officially announce the closure of this panel. Thank you so much, everyone, for your participation, either as our great speakers today, I can only um, applaud to your to your talk. Sorry for my technology. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. There's just again, there's just a reminder about the complexity of science, <laughs> which is exactly and I have to see you, I? <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly the spirit of, of our topic. And I warmly invite you to the final treat of uh, our conference that we're going to have in around half an hour. The final talk that um, Andre has already very helpfully mentioned. Uh, so please, please rejoin us. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there very shortly. I have Thank an appointment so in half an hour, but uh, give my best to Kola, to Kopasov, uh, and because I, I need to run already. Sure. Sorry.